So this um, this submission is from the Huri Hiranui District Council, written by Monique uh, and supported by uh, Mayor Mari and Vince. So when you're ready. Good afternoon, everybody, and thank you for um, providing us um, time on behalf of the Hiranui District to speak to our submission, submission um, for Environment Canterbury's long-term plan. Um, I am um, with great pleasure that I introduce uh, Deputy Mayor Vince uh, Daly to you and Monique, who is our Senior Planner at Hiranui District Council. Um, just in, in starting, I would like to acknowledge the significant progress that, uh, particularly in water quality, that ECAN has made. However, we do have concerns as a district council uh, in regard to the rate increases, which we consider are unaffordable to many in the district that we do represent. Um, I do take it that you've all taken time to read our submission and are fully um, aware of the issues that I will speak to today. Um, our priority focus is in regard to the proposed work program, the resourcing of that to achieve the work that is proposed, and make a suggestion to Environment Canterbury that uh, this should be delivered potentially over the life of the plan. Uh, we note that a large portion of the um, proposed work is suggested in work, uh, year one of the over the 10 year plan. I'd just like to take an opportunity to consider for you to consider the impact on our rural ratepayers uh, who we consider uh, paying a disproportionate amount in this proposal. Um, all Hiranui district ratepayers, both urban and rural, will experience an increase. And one example I would like to cite is um, a $4,251 increase in option one as proposed. Um, this particular property currently looks after their own land. They pay a substantial charge to the irrigation company, of which a large portion of that goes to improving catchment environment outcomes. We do urge Environment Canterbury to encourage landowners in this space rather than penalising them with increased regulation or costs. Uh, our second point is in regard to the impact on residential um, properties in the Hiranui district. We do note that random samples show a 34 to 40% increase as opposed to properties within the Christchurch area where the proposed increase is around 18%. Um, I guess that in regard to my first comment, the disproportionate way that the, the rate uh, proposals are structured. And we urge you to consider also the Move with Urgency campaign and propose that this demonstrates a lack of awareness and understanding to deliver the work to the communities that we um, are responsible for and to. And just to Oh, maybe I'll come back to that question at the end. Um, I'd just also like to come back to the to the understanding that, as I said before, we do generally support the work program, but uh, do really question the value in front-loading um, the options that are provided in year one of the plan and ask you to consider the option of smoothing the proposed work program over the life of the plan. Um, we understand, and as, as I'm sure you will as well, that staffing and resourcing of that proposed work program alone will not enable um, or will be difficult to enable achievements in this area. And um, there again, I'm very aware that um, the current legislation is demanding and uh, we do urge Environment Canterbury to work in a more collaborative way of using a more bottom-up principles to ensure communities are encouraged, not discouraged, with this legislation, which uh, potentially is what is designed in your proposed program. Uh, within the Hiranui District, we are fully aware of the burden of legislation. We know we have coming the MPEs on biodiversity, natural climate change adaptation plans and emission budgets. And we do 
consider that um, we probably need to take a more cautious approach to this legislation. Whilst we know it is um, on its way, we are all uncertain of the responsibilities and requirements in relation to that. And um, we are concerned, or there is a general concern, that uh, if we front foot too much the legislation and the uncertainty of those responsibilities, that we may, in effect, be asking ratepayers to um, pay twice um, because um, we are uncertain of what the legislation may be and what the impact for our ratepayers may be as well. Um, we do consider that there are other toolbox, tools in the toolbox that may be used um, to support uh, communities, particularly rural communities that have um, potential affordability issues um, for targeted groups and um, wonder whether a consideration around rate rebates have been um, considered in that in this proposal to support uh, the rural communities with um, providing uh, some in incentive to um, uh, to those communities or the targeted groups. Um, so they are the issues that we have highlighted mostly in our um, in our written submission. Um, and I guess the, just before we go into potential question time, I'm mindful of the time, but um, we just wanted to understand, and perhaps you might be able to un help us understand that we would like to uh, question, are you able to describe to us what a residential ratepayer in a rural township, and we'll use an example in our written submission, a uh, hardened settlement, it's a settlement of about 200 people, um, what will they receive for their 44.5% uh, potential rate increase. Um, I'm just going to ask Vince, is there anything else you would like to add to that in this presentation, Tom Vince? No, just um, leading on to um, there's still legislation to be worked through, and I think you sometimes might be putting the horse, the cart before the horse. And um, I know as an example of myself, you know, I've all I've done a farm plan and everything. But now I'll have to redo my farm plan because of the change in legislation. And so, you know, it's just um, we need a bit of certainty on things. And, um, you know, I think the community just gets wound down a bit. And if things like that start happening, uh, people start losing it, uh, their drives. Thank you, Murray. Um, and thank you, Vince. Monique, Monique. Yeah, and that's great. And thank you for the, your question about that household but we'll take it as rhetorical that opens a big door for councillors around this table and we're only going to allow them to ask you questions of clarification we will provide you that information but but not here today so so questions please uh councillor edge councillor clearwater council farm council hands thank you Mary. just a fairly simple question uh, you're, you're generally supporting everything in, in the plan, so that's under option one. The issue for you, am I right, is, is really just the, the way and the affordability of, of that. Um, I guess in context, it is about the affordability um, and, the, and the pressure that uh, will be imposed on our community. And I guess it comes back to my question of, are there options that you can put in place to support our rural ratepayers, like the rate rebate scheme for communities that are, are suffering? We need to be thinking at this time around um, the climate that is affecting our rural ratepayers, the inability to um, afford something as proposed, even option or two, option one or two in this current model will be difficult and a challenge for our rural communities who we are just going into another significant drought and I actually think this all needs to be factored in. Thank you, Mary, for your deputation. Um, you seem to be saying that what one thing you'd like us to do is to look at how we could smooth out the proposed work plans. So in terms of how we do that, are you would you support the, the possibility of borrowing or uh, it, would it be some clear reductions that you are referring to? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Thanks. Well, what we're looking at is 
is that the targeting groups, and, and uh, I think there's been a bit of um, discussion about the affordability for certain parts of our community. And um, you look at your um, uniform, annual. uniform annual charge, it's only, I know as a Haranui district, we, you're allowed up to 30%. We run always at about 29.9. So mm. it gives, and, and I think you're running at about a seven. Mm. And, uh, you know, and for people that could not afford that, they could always apply for the... Just alongside the possibility of a regression rate, which has actually already been increased. I just wanted to say, for example, in the whole areas of our air quality or transport, if there are any particular areas there where you believe, in fact, we could be able to, to reduce or extend right out, if you've got any suggestions. In transport, yeah. we don't actually have any public transport in Haranui. And um, air quality, um, I don't think that's a real big issue in the Haranui either, so, um, in those two departments. But um, just, it's more on the environmental work trying to get, it's getting, I think you people will have problems getting enough staff, qualified staff with the expertise in that short time. So spreading it out, we're meaning, you know, spreading out over over the life of your plan. That'll be a matter, of course, for, you, for the CEO, who should be well aware of the instinct of making, making that point. My final question is, with the examples you've given us on, on your first page, like particularly, say, the rural examples, which has got quite a significant increase in their rates, give us an idea of what kind of valuations those properties will be at. Um, yeah. yeah, I'm talking the rural ones particularly. You might like to tell us the other ones, but it's the rural ones. I just wondered if you could give us some examples. Of I would just say off the top of my head, um, a residential home in Harden Township would probably be Two hundred and fifty to three hundred thousand dollars. And the rural properties you've listed there too, please. Look, yeah, yeah. We're not going to dig into this at all, actually. Farmer Chiviet, looking at the rate, <laughs> rate, it would be about a three, three, two and a half to three million dollar property. I was about to say that these are your figures. We'll trust your figures that you've done the right figures. So yeah, so thanks, Phil. But we'll move on. Councillor Palm. Yeah, thanks so much. And thanks so much for your um, comments here around biodiversity. And clearly you're very proud of your own district's biodiversity. You've got some really amazing projects going on. That was really the topic of my question. Um, just asking for a bit more clarity because um, in your submission, you request more encouragement, support incentives for the great landowners already doing fantastic work. Um, but then you talk about how if we're going to be using rates to help farmers by actually employing people to help them, that though that money would be best just left in the farmers' pockets. So are you saying there's a balance or do you prefer one or the other? Is Yeah, well, interesting some thoughts there. Certainly as a district, what we have found the greatest favour and the greatest impact is working with our landowners to achieve the to achieve the right outcome rather than perverse outcomes, which can can be, you know, unintended consequences. Um, we have um, a strong history of working closely with our communities, and and taking that bottom up approach is certainly going to get the best results. Um, I, I suppose in many ways we would uh, see the value in Environment Canterbury providing some science to back up. That, those options. So we wonder whether that investment should be um, delivered from an ECAM perspective with good evaluative data that we can support our communities, particularly our landowners, to um, achieve, you know, the, the big picture to, if we're thinking biodiversity, to actually endorse their projects um, is what we'd be considering would be the best outcome. Um, supporting something like you know, the QE2 covenants, the QE2 trusts, you know, where we provide a, a rates remission on that land um, certainly incentivises, you know, best actions, best outcomes. So um, we, we 
absolutely believe in the ground up and working with our community, working with our fam and farmers to achieve that success. Anything else? Oh. Okay, um, got time for one more, uh, Councillor Hands. Thanks, Mary. Um, your submission refers to the essential fresh water package and uh, our loan to water plan not being recognised uh, by government, unfortunately. Um, is it the Hironui District Council's position that we should be asking government for recognition of that and, then, uh, and that would change our expenditure in that space? Yeah, that's probably the likely position. Thank you. Look, thank you. It's a long way to come for just a very short period of time, Murray. But thank you and, and Vince and Monique for coming and, and for your continued leadership, Murray, in the Hurunui District at, and, and your close relationship with us. It's uh, really valued. So thank you. Thank you. So our next submitter is David Hawke. And David is on behalf of the Hallsville Residents Association. I understand you have a PowerPoint, David. Is that right? And, and again, just the, the rough rules, not rough rules, the rules. 10 minutes, uh, if you get to nine, you'll hear a wee bell from Louise, uh, and then we'll do questions up to that last minute. Thank you. So I'm guessing that um, the, I will say next slide and things will happen at that point. Is that the, right, okay. So, um, kia ora, ko David Hawkeho. Um, my name is David Hawke, so I'm Secretary of the Horsall Residents Association, and uh, it's thank you very much for the opportunity to, to speak to you today. Uh, normally I'd have uh, our Chairman, John Bennett, uh, sitting with me, but he's tripping around the North Island somewhere. It's uh, We've encouraged our members to put in uh, individual submissions on the uh, ECAN long-term plan, uh, and I know some have done that but uh, I'm very much talking on an association perspective today, and we're focusing very much on the public transport part of the long-term plan. Um, so the three points that we want to emphasise from our submission is going to start off with a fairly technical angle first, and that's our request that you change your uh, public time, uh, sorry, public transport um, timetable adherence level of service target, which is uh, level of service target 29, from what you could say counting buses to counting passengers. So that's the first point we want to emphasise. We're then going to swing a little bit to ask that you work with uh, com community partners and government agencies to mitigate the effects of transport corridors on the communities that they pass through. And then at the end, we're going to bring those two points together to argue that you've got, as a council, have got an enormous opportunity to transform transport in Canterbury, um, especially through public transport lanes on key routes. So uh, starting off with the level of service target. So just reading out the level of service target from your documentation, it states that at least 95% of trips depart their timetabled starting location time on time. Um, so change that to at least 95% of passengers. So rather than trips, passengers depart their timetable starting location on time and arrive at their timetable destination on time. So broadly speaking, um, buses are timed roughly evenly through the day, but probably for anyone who lives in Christchurch, stating the obvious bus patronage varies widely through the day. So if you want to run a customer focused service, which is what your long term plan talks about, we think it's misleading to base your level of service target on when a bus leaves rather than when the bus passengers board and arrive. So in our proposal, we're basically saying that you should weight your level of service target by the number of people boarding the bus rather than the bus on its own. So um, we're obviously most familiar with Horswell, so that would mean that uh, departure and arrival of peak time services is weighted in this le change level of service target at the expense of non-peak time services. We fully realise that making that change to that level of service target has uh, enormous implications and that it can't happen overnight. But if you adopt this mindset, and it is a mindset change, we think it would transform your approach to public transport from buses to people. 
sort of following on a little bit from that and going sideways. So if you've got, um, we're on to the next slide now, is mitigating the effect of transport corridors on, um, on affected communities. So for whatever reason and however this has happened, um, we have a, our district uh, has a strong emphasis on private vehicles and road transport. But the consequences such as noise, air pollution, um, diminution of active transport, safety and so on, they, um, they tend to be visited on local communities. And we were a bit surprised, I guess, at the absence of any reference in your draft long-term plan document on the effect of these transport systems on the communities through which they pass. Uh, we're obviously talking about Horsewall. Uh, we understand we've been working a bit with the Addington community. It's also affected by this particular question that they're going to be calling by and talking to you next week. They are faced with the prospect of the uh, Transport Agency six laning a section of Brougham Street through their community. So these effects are actually quite large. In Horsewall, we have uh, similar issues, but at a smaller scale. Um, the picture on the screen that you've got in front of you um, shows Horsell Junction Road. So um, many of you will be familiar with that. But it's a very similar sort of story on Horsell Road, Nichols Road, Sparks Road, Dunbar's Road, Avonfield Drive, Wigram Road, Wincops Road, and on and on and on. And so we think that you should, or we, we, what I've got in my notes is we request that you earnestly work on this issue. So that this question of mitigating effects through, of, uh, through corridors. And so now the opportunity. So we think that, um, or we see ourselves sort of drowning in a sea of single occupancy cars. Some are ours, and some of them are from Selwyn District, and we think that there's a better way. There's obviously no silver bullet, but um, part of the solution must be in express bus services that are frequent, on time, reliable, and tight journey times. We have seen an inkling of this, not in our immediate area, but uh, with the Rangiora project, um, and the number seven but Horsell bus route is at last seeing the start of some bus priority lanes along Horsell Road and Lincoln Road. There's lots of potential for more public transport lanes and express buses, but um, we think we could go even bolder than that. Uh, we're talking much more of a, a sort of regional level here, which is obviously your remit. So the Eddington folk are going to talk to you about dedicating an existing lane on the Southern Motorway all the way from Rolleston to just express public transport and heavy goods vehicles. And given the amount of traffic from Rolleston, this would have enormous benefits for us, because a lot of them come through Horsell, and obviously the people in Addington. So one of the things that the plan mentions quite a lot is the leadership role that you have as a council, and we think here's your chance. And uh, one of the things that we also reiterate in our plan is that we're keen to contribute. So thank you very much for listening. But thank you for that. Um, and sorry about the interruption. I just thought we could get our tech a bit better, but uh, that's what we've got. So, quick councillors, questions from councillors? Councillor Clearwater? Thank you very much, David, for your very thoughtful um, ideas, and especially, especially around the, um, the levels of service. Um, well, a little bit. So, I just had a couple of questions, though. Like, with your, on page three, with your request that we, and it linking, um, future land use with, with um, for example, urban development and, and the planning, and just your how you see our role at ECAM to be involved with that. So you really say, like, one was the Our Space, which was the greatest Christchurch partnership document, but are you also referring perhaps to the, some of the district plans that um, territory authorities also are developing? Yeah, I guess what we're seeing is that there's... Um a disconnect between what ECAN is saying it wants to achieve and what local authorities are actually playing out in their district plans. And we had a really good example of that uh, at the first of the Our Space hearings, where um, we talked a bit about uh, implementing the 8 to 80 Cities initiative and the response that the um, panel had uh, which, if I remember, was chaired by the Selwyn District Mayor or Deputy Mayor, was that, yep, that was really great, it was exciting and so on, but that it should get played out in the um, in district plans and, and of the constituent authorities. And that just doesn't happen. 
And so that's that's the disconnect. And I'm, I don't um, I don't know how you actually manage to get that to happen. But what I would say at the moment is that it is not happening. A question, if I may, because I was really interested in your request for like a second express bus for Horsewall, other other suburbs like that too. Earlier this today, we had a had a request from an, another part of the city, Beckham actually, where in fact they were wanting a first bus in in some key parts of the area. So I guess while your question, while your request is around um, patronage, and, and because we expect lots more people, have you got any suggestions as to how we actually widen the coverage of our bus routes? This is one of the real troubles of the way of the urban form that we have got to deal with, in the sense that. Um, and you know, like we're obviously dealing with Christchurch City Council uh, in this regard and their city plan. So they've got an urban development strategy that talks, talks about um, about uh, tr public transport spines and development along that, and that hasn't happened. Uh, there is, uh, like, um, ECAN has, a, I think, is it uh, demand responsive transport? Is DRT? Is that what you? I think is what you call it um, in Timaru. And I think that that's going to really struggle in a place like Hallsville. We've, we've talked a bit about this at our meetings, but the problem with demand responsive transport is the time that it takes to connect from um, you being picked up in your, um, in your house or whatever in Cloverton and getting to the bus stop where you have to wait for the next bus. So you've got two lots of waiting. And it comes back to that question that we had at the start, which is about... Um, how people actually, uh, I've lost my thread there, that, that question at the, part, the start about making the, the service sort of um, timely, reliable, and so on. And, and, I, and I think the DRT is, is a bit of a struggle in that regard. There's, there's actually, I don't know if you're aware, but there's an outfit called Landor, which is London Councils, and they have a webinar coming up next Thursday on demand responsive transport and it's addressing exactly those sorts of questions so i've signed in okay one more question thank you councillor hands thanks david uh really thorough submission and thank you for going right into the detail of the levels of service just uh in terms of a broad concept around investment in public transport you're asking for a more transformative investment is the Residents Association supportive of if we were to raise the the target of rate in order to undertake that investment to increase services? That's a, that's an interesting question. As an association, we avoid just uh, putting rates in our submissions because in our association we will have people who despise every cent that they put in for ECAN. And you'll have other people who are saying, well, why don't you spend 10 times as much? And for us to arrive at a consensus would probably end up with blood in the streets. <laughs> That's a great political answer, it really is. And thank you for that. And I think that the challenges that you bring to us are in terms of the PT conundrum that we will face and also urban form, which is something that we're paying attention to too. So thank you, Dave. Thank you very much for your time. I really appreciate it. Next to matter is David Winter. Welcome, David. Um, the process is uh, 10 minutes, 9 minutes, the bell, and then questions. So when you're ready. Uh, welcome, everyone. Um, thanks for the opportunity to um, present here today. My name's Dave Winter. I'm a farmer from um, North Canterbury, well, just over the Wymac actually, halfway area there. Um, spent the last 20 years crafting my trade. It used to be quite fun here. I never really imagined I was going to end up sitting in here talking about rates and arguing about a few other things, but that's another story. Um, I'm here to represent our family business, WJ Winter and Sons. Uh, we've been going for about 70 years. Um, we've obviously survived a few, a few setbacks along the way. We're still here to tell the story. Um, my main submission is around the um, financials of the long-term plan and the extravagant rate rise. Um, just to put things into context, 
probably option one and option two. There's not much difference for them. They just spans one another. In terms of spending, um, anything that increases more than 5%, if I had all my suppliers say to me I'm putting up a price of 25%, um, I'd be out of business tomorrow. So I thought that's quite interesting. So I've got a um, cropping farm, about 250 hectares. That's looking at a rate rise of around about $1,300. And um, also a shareholder in a dairy farm, it's looking at about $1,400 going up. Um, just to bring in a few numbers around that, my total ETANS rate bill will now be $11,000. So I'm probably going to demand slightly more value in terms of what I receive. Probably the um, other point I would make, that rate bill of $11,000 is made up of 75% is roughly in the general rate, which is based on the capital value of my farm. What probably really bugs me is the um, uniform annual general rate charge is only $45. So that's only about 7% if I look at your figures of your actual annual rates take. So that pretty much means me as a farmer with a so-called big farm with lots of money if I perceive to want to sell it, which I'm not really in the business of. So I'm not really sure why that is so low in comparison with other areas around New Zealand. I um, looked up my WDC rates last night and I see they're $120 for their annual uniform annual general rate charge. Probably as a farmer, it appears as though looking at these documents that I'm going to be paying more for the user pay services of ECAN that I have to use in terms of consenting and monitoring and that. So that's all going to be going up. So I'm just quite interested to see that effectively I'm going to be paying twice if I'm paying for all this other stuff that I don't really use very often, like the public transport and everything else. So I would have thought that they're actually things that people use. So I am really a landowner as such. I don't have a lot of people attached, so I'm not really sure why I should be paying twice. In terms of the um, costs of going up, I see there's a lot of work that's gone around the essential fresh water. And I know that this last 10 years around the sea can table, you've spent preparing the Canterbury Land and Water Plan and its various different plan changes. So I see that I'm not really sure why we're going to need to be spending more money on that when we've already been spending money on it. I know we have some new regulations that we have to comply with that have come from central government. However, we've probably been spending the vicinity of five or six million dollars a year on that plan. So I would say that I'm not really sure why it needs to go any more money needs to go into planning just to update the plan that you've already done. I mean the ink's not even dry on plan change seven. And then Probably it appears that the RMA is going to change, so I'm not really sure how and why. You can write a plan when you don't really know what the overarching rules are going to be and the implications of that. Um, the other thing I would like to probably see some um, clarification around is probably this 14 million increase in the regional and strategic leadership. Uh, it'll be interesting to see where that extra 14 million is going to be spent and what I'm going to see for it. In terms of um, borrowing to keep going, I mean, as a farmer, if I have to go cap in hand to see my bank manager because I've had a bad year or two, he's not normally too happy to see me. In terms of um, borrowing to keep going, that's pretty much something you do to get out of jail after you've had a bad year. Um, unless you're buying an asset or building an asset, probably somewhere flash like this, you know, it's a bit of a debt and it's probably going to be paid off over time. So that's something that is okay. However, just borrowing to write some plans or do some things that feel good for the day, I think that's a very, very dangerous way of doing business. And I'd say it's very, yeah, not good at all. I wouldn't expect. I'd say it's um, economic suicide, actually. In terms of um, some of the spending, there's an extra 30 mil coming out of the Canary economy to fund this. What I see is lots of wants. Lots of nice to haves. However, we've just got to work out what the must haves are. Everything has a trade off. If something's broken, yeah, we've got to fix it. But normally, if we're paying something to get fixed, something else has got to be delayed a bit. 
it's like I said, I've only got so much money to go around, so the more money that's going out my gate on rates, it's probably something less I'm going to spend on the local community or doing nice things on the farm, i.e. farming less intensively. Um, if I refer to the um, Waimea District Council long-term plan, I see their average increase over the next 10 years is around 3.5%. If I look at the ECAN plan, it's about 58% in total or 5.5% every year. So in summing up, I'm just a grumpy farmer really, but any questions? Hey, um, thanks Dave for coming in and representing your region and giving us a bit of a, a view of how you see what we're trying to do here in terms of the long-term plan. Nothing is final, so the decisions that we make on the submissions will be made once we've heard all the submissions. Now, are there councillors that have got questions. Uh, Councillor Marshall. Kia ora, thanks Peter, and thanks Dave for coming this, this side of the Waimea Pirate. It's always great when someone's willing to cross the river. Um, and I really appreciate your submission today. Um, I was just wondering if you could give some examples um, around what you'd expect to see in return for your rates going up. What I'd like to see, uh, it would be quite good if I could get the um, Kaipoi River cleaned out and Courtney River cleaned out. I know if my father was here today, he'd be absolutely banging on about you because, um, as he said, he's seen a lot of um, what he calls deferred maintenance and the river works and that sort of things since the um, good old North Canterbury Cashman Board days. I don't think I quite remember them. I was probably still running around in that piece. So, other than that, what else would I like to see? Um, probably just value for dollar spent, probably not so much wastage in a way, and probably like. I'm a farmer, I like bricks and mortar type stuff. I like to see things in action rather than aspirational statements and plans, I guess you would say. Any other questions from councillors? Okay, Dave, we've bleed off the hook now. So thank you for that. That was great that you came in and did that um, and take some time out of your day to do that. As you said, you didn't think when you started you'd end up doing this, but this is how we make uh, this is how we make our decisions by listening to people like you, so thank you. The next uh, presentation is from the Waimakariri District Council, uh, uh, Lee Gordon, uh, Vice uh, yeah, Neville and Jim. You can all come to the table, please. And we're in your hands, Dan, when you're ready to go. Firstly, apologies um, for being late. Both the Deputy Mayor and myself were uh, never late, and we were at a funeral for a um, well known identity in our community, Mike Dormer, who um, sadly passed away. He had wishes for his funeral, which started at 11 to be 55 minutes in length, that rivaled Catholic funerals, and I am a Catholic, and it was well over um, two hours. So he wouldn't have been impressed with that, but it was a lovely service for him. So. We're running from there, so our apologies. So, firstly, um, I'm joined by Deputy Mayor Neville Atkinson and also our, our new Chief Executive, um, Jim Harland, who I think it's day 16 in the job. Um, I keep counting those until we get to the first month. So, look, firstly, um, thank you for the opportunity to submit. Um, and I want to acknowledge the strong uh, working relationship our Council has with you all. In particular, I'd like to especially acknowledge how much we enjoy uh, working with Chair Jenny and your Chief Executive uh, Stephanie, uh, both the Greater Christchurch um, Partnership and also uh, the Canterbury Mural Forum. We appreciate that relationship we have. All councils are challenged to exercise restraint as New Zealand and the world recovers from COVID-19 pandemic that economically and socially will have implications for communities for many years to come. First hand, we see the impact this has on families and businesses who have had to make hard decisions to survive. 
Why make a district council, and I'm proud of this, has responded to this challenge accordingly, and despite many calls from the community for expenditure, has phased over time both increased costs and funding them to cushion the impacts. We have also looked to defer some major projects as we don't think it appropriate to load additional burden on ratepayers at a time when our community are still experiencing the effects of COVID-19. Not only are councils challenged by COVID-19 impacts, as you know, we are entering a major era, era of reforms that will impact on the roles and responsibilities of local authorities and other local and regional institutions for decades to come. Three Waters, RMA, Future, oh, I had old local government that's changed lately, now it's Future for local government, sorry. Future for local government, the restructuring of the polytechnic sector underway and the impending transformation of health service delivery are all upon us with uh, prospectively more reforms waiting in the wings. The cumulative implications of these changes are uncertain, but likely to have a profound, and I would say it suggests an element of caution is appropriate before embarking on major new undertakings at this time. In light of this context, our council believes the rate rise proposed in the first year of ECAN's LTP is unacceptably high and should be fundamentally reconsidered. This is a view we hear strongly and repeatedly from ratepayers in our area. These points have also been echoed, echoed by our community boards in their submissions. Our council has not made, and I find it difficult to come here in this, this way, it's not certainly how we like to uh, come about, but um, we haven't made a submission like this to ECAN before because ECAN hasn't uh, proposed an expansionary program over such a short time before. Communities have been asked to look past the percentage rise and consider the average dollar increase is similar to that posed by territorial authorities. This argument implies there is a license to consider such an increase every year, which should, in our opinion, not be the case. The rise sets the base rate and cost up a quarter in one year for the foreseeable future. It is not just a one-off increase, and it is proposed to be followed by a further 9% increase in year two, suggesting a cumulative increase in ECAN's rates revenue based by a third over the two next two years. In general terms, a key driver for the extent of the rise has been cited as the regulatory requirements imposed by the new NPS on fresh water. However, the linkage between those and the package of works attached to the proposed 24.5% rate increase has not been further defined in terms of both what it is and what it sorry, both what is and will be delivered and end in what time frame to achieve compliance and what metrics will be used to demonstrate the ensuing expected benefits of that outcome. In our opinion, realistic options have not been set out in the LT consultation document. Two packages of works at marginally different costs are leading to a 24.5 or an 18% rate increase are proposed. Specific options for addressing the issues facing the region and the implications of each of these options are not specified in the consultation document. Phasing of program implementation save the marginal rate rise difference and the use of loan funding to smooth the financial impacts are not presented as options that we could see for Canterbury ratepayers to consider. Page 14 of your CD states, environmental initiatives we need to progress but are not yet required by legislation. While getting ahead can be applauded, getting ahead at a time when we face an uncertain economic climate in future, we suggest, may not be wise. It is not at all clear what programs ECAN will be delivering to Waimakere residents, including the costs, benefits and timeframes for delivery, apart from, to a degree, the public transport. Urban ratepayers in Waimakere are facing a 203% PT rate, uh, rates rise in four years, um, 
to be in 2021-22 This would be a 42% more than urban Selwyn and comparable with that of an equivalent $500,000 capital valued residential property in Christchurch City, the latter enjoying a demonstrably higher level of service. There has been no justification provided for this large increase for residents in Waimakari urban areas. Our submission details how in recent consultations by ECAN, the extent and rationale for proposed rate increases for enhanced bus service services is demonstrably different to that now proposed. We remind you of the commitment for a staged and gradual approach to the introduction of improved public transport offerings. As set out in your PT consultation material in late 2019, and note the staged WDC development of park and ride facilities in the district to help manage COVID-related issues and rating impact. Page four of our submission draws attention to our submission points of last year, where we remind you of the argument that, sorry, the agreement that was reached with your staff following the consultation. We also include a link of the consultation that ECAN went out to our community stating maximum increase. Respectively, respectfully, we ask you to please keep to what was agreed and follow the consultation that was had with our community. We all went out on the limb to support the greater good with Park and Ride. Anecdotally, it is pleasing to see and hear the feedback from users. I personally found the service excellent and the deputy mayor and myself that often come into meetings on the bus and it's a great service and we're pleased to see it. I am going to raise a topic that I wasn't going to, but it's around the Ashley tree removal. Um, I have raised it as a submission point uh, because of our concern about the lack of progress following the good work that both Chair Jenny, Councillors Edge, Mackay and myself made to restore relationships with our community. We request the establishment of an ECAN-led steering group to work with our community to restore this area. You all, well, those who know, know I'm very frustrated at how long this matter is taking. It is unacceptable how long this matter is taking to get a, a simple uh, committee in place or working group to work with our community. I, I can't understand why it can't be put together sooner. And I've raised this frustration with both your councillors and chair and staff. So I want to make that point really strongly because I'm getting it in the air in my community who really want to see progress uh, on this measure. It's very important to a large number in our community. To conclude, we all have points of difference from time to time. It shows the strength, I think, of our friendship and relationship that we can be open uh, with those uh, points of view. We strongly urge ECAN to consider intergenerational equity, to slow programs down, loan fund where possible, and look to ways of smoothing the effect of the proposed rate increases in the LTP. This is what we do at our council so that we can minimise that impact and spread that over a number of years. Thank you again for the opportunity to submit and for hearing and considering our submission points. Happy to take any questions. Uh, thank you so much, Dan, for being so forthright with us. I uh, would have doubted that you wouldn't be when you walked through the door, so thank you for that, and we'll take that on board. Questions from Councillor Clearwater, Councillor Edge. Thank you, Dan. In terms of smoothing out, smoothing out the, over a number of years, are you also including the possibility of us borrowing more in order to do that? Well, I think I think that's implied, definitely. Um, that's what our council does. So we, I understand you have the same rating as we do with Sandra and Paws, we don't they? Are you with Sandra Paws or Fitch? Fitch, well, same, similar rating agency. So there's never been a cheaper time, and your balance sheet, um, from what I understand, has very little debt on it. So you can probably borrow cheaper than we can as a council because we have older debt on our books. So I'm not a financial expert, but we have people on our council staff that are people like Jeff Millwood, our previous chief executive, Jim um, Palmer, were experts in getting out there and getting us the best rates, hedging our bets and then making hedging our debt. 
and then making sure that we um, uh, took loans over a long period of time. We take loans over a 30 year period of time. That ensures intergenerational equity. It helps take those edges off some of those big spikes that you uh, experience. Don't want to tell you how to suck eggs, but that would be our firm recommendation to you to consider that policy. Thanks, Dan. I acknowledge your um, issue regarding the Ashley Brackery River, and I'm sure that will be taken up um, by staff. Um, in terms of the borrowing, just picking up your discussion there on your on your page one, uh, um, you talk about in that uh, third last paragraph there um, that we should take the opportunity to do some borrowing. One of the prime functions for environment can be perhaps the prime function is intergenerational considerations of, of the future. So we're thinking of But you're suggesting here that um, uh, you, that, it, that if borrowing is for both capital and perhaps non-capital expenditure, that's something that we should consider, is it? Just suggesting as an option for you to consider, but far be it from us to tell you what to do. Um, but you know, we, we look at our own program and it's ambitious at times, but there are some things we, we've had to go to our community and say we just can't do it this time. Uh, and then we, we had to take net strike an earthquake recovery loan. Um, so we have over $100 million of debt, which we absorbed all our earthquake-related projects into one. First 1% 1 of our rate rise every year is paying, uh, gradually paying down that loan. Uh, but it was the, the fairest way of of taking that each off. If we'd have gone out with that 100 million, it would have crippled our rate payers and they wouldn't have thanked us for that. Our youth council um, re regularly have to manage their expectations. They have all sorts of great ideas that I'd love to see implemented, including a hydro slide uh, at our pools, uh, particularly Dudley and, and at Kaikoi Aquatic Centre. But the cost of that is just simply we just can't afford to do that at the moment. Uh, and it's a nice to have. And that's just simply where we have got to in terms of managing our community's expectations at times. Sometimes you just can't implement the program as quickly as you'd like. Spreading that over a longer period, looking at options, does it all have to be done in one year? Can it not be staged? Are uh, matters that we as a council consider all the time, and I'm sure you will as well. Uh, all we're humbly suggesting is just that if it wasn't clear in these documents here that that had been considered, and perhaps that may be a way of helping um, ease that program over a number of years to get greater buy-in. The point is well made, uh, Mayor Gordon. I'm just aware that we have Councillor uh, Mackay online, so I'm going to go to Councillor um, Hands for her question, and Claire, if you've got something to say, maybe after uh, Councillor Hands has spoken. I don't want to labour this because we've talked about the borrowing a bit, but just, just for clarity, do you borrow for operational expenditure or things like policy documents regularly or only for CAPEX? No, we wouldn't borrow for operational work. We might borrow for a major renewal, which normally you try and find out appreciation. If there was some significant asset which needed renewing, we didn't quite have enough money, we might borrow for the edge of that, but primarily around capital. Thank you. Councillor Mackay, have you got something that you'd like to say? Obviously not. Uh, so thank you. I think we've come to the end of this, uh, Mayor Gordon. Uh, thank you for that. And as I say, thank you for being so forthright with us. And uh, we certainly will consider everything that you've said uh, in our deliberations. Good to see you, John. Good to see you, Neville. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so, Jane, uh, Jane's our next submitter, Jane Demerton. I see you there, Jane. That's all cleared out on you, Jane. Good. 
Kia ora koutou koutoua, ko Jane Demeter toko inua. I'm not here as any representative or expert, but just as a member of your community who believes you need to hear a wide range of community views and representation, and particularly from people who don't have a financial interest in what's under discussion. For me, your LTP is a bit tricky to comment on, specifically without seeing all the underlying documents and data that you've had access to for the last six months. So I'll stick to your key points and just highlight a couple of issues. Freshwater is and should continue to be your number one priority, in my opinion, given the current trend. We're 10 years into the CWMS, goals and outcomes are not being met as anticipated. And as somebody who's been involved in the CWMS for right since the beginning, really, um, it seems that to date, first order priorities of environment, customary use, community and stock water supplies have not had their needed focus thus far. Time to change. One item in particular is the protection of groundwater. The water that runs through our aquifers is fresh water. And so protecting the habitat and ecosystems in aquifers is your responsibility under the RMA and appears to have no needed measures in place. Seems to me that protecting aquifer fresh water should have meant more due diligence before you embarked on ma projects. Perhaps baseline aquifer endemic biodiversity studies should have been done. What if the possible changes, the outcomes, being changes to water chemistry and the oxygen levels in your aquifer when you upset the aquifer balance? And you can have the potential generation of ammonia, hydrogen sulfide, and methane within your aquifers if you mess with the stygofauna and the biofilms too much. So it seems to me addressing this is way overdue, but not included in projects as far as I can tell. For me, enactment of current regional flow plans should be prioritized that the Hurunui Waiao Regional Plan is going into its second generation without the increased flows set back in 2014 should not be. Here's hoping your increased monitoring is sufficient this time to deliver a robust plan. Sufficient and comprehensive enough because we got very little on the Waiao Ufa last time around. Monitoring data collection and enforcement of existing requirements should be stepped up, in my opinion. A data systems upgrade is essential because only then will you have confidence that you have reliable data. Random audits should be the norm to ensure compliance. I would suggest that you need to address the sources of issues rather than tinkering with symptoms. Retain more water in rivers because current effects are the effects of current takes, very often significantly less, less than the 100% consented. So if we have these water takes in taking their maximum of 100%, we're going to see increased effects. And yet much consideration is given to the effects we currently see, not what we might anticipate with 100% take. It's a bit hard to tell these days where we're at with the actual amount of takes, consented takes being taken, because I haven't seen a report for, I think, 2014 was the last one that I know of. Uh, I would suggest that you need to set more stringent bottom lines to limit, it, to limit contaminant loading. Has there been an analysis of the loadings projected back in 2010 modeling compared with what is being currently measured? Is it what's expected or is there wide variance? If we are way in excess 
of what the 2010 modeling anticipated, we've got some serious work to do. Do plans need consequent adjustments? I don't know. Um, I know the plans have limits around um, exotic tree planting in water sensitive catchments, but I suspect we're probably sucking up way more water in the upper catchments than we ever really anticipated. Are those guidance and those limitations around exotic tree planting sufficient? Um, I note that you have a major tree planting program suggested in your areas of focus, and I largely support native trees and shrub plantings, but I have some concerns. I see nothing about the word protection and the protection of remnant patches, functioning ecosystems developed over millennia will give you far more bang for your buck and support your biodiversity than planting a million new trees, which would take decades, if not centuries, to develop fully functioning complex ecosystems. Have you had input from your ecologists on this? Uh, I guess I would comment, don't be lured into thinking riparian planting is your solution to pollution. And so as I look at those key areas that you highlighted, um, one of them is flood protection and infrastructure. And for me, there's a tension between uh, the infrastructure related to flood protection and allowing our rivers to do the meander that they have historically done. When you Berm up your river into these straight channels. Yes, you flush that water right out to sea, but these days we need to be thinking about retaining our water. When you look at overseas projects, we're under, mm, it's not Amsterdam. They've actually reintroduced the meander right under their buildings in, in the downtown and the port. It's not Amsterdam, it's in Belgium, I think, isn't it? Can't remember where, but I mean, we need to start thinking about slowing the movement of that water down a bit. Um, and for the most part, I support the other um, key issues. So regarding option A versus option B, I support A because as I understand it, financial reserves were pretty much cleaned out by your predecessors. And I would say, be bold and do the right thing by your grandchildren. In 10 years time, will they say that you have done enough? Kira, I welcome your questions. Jane, um, your great experience uh, in the environmental space has given us some pretty strong questions and, and areas that I wouldn't have thought that we were gonna go into, but Lan. Kia ora, thanks for your submission, Jane. and your great contribution to the CWMS over many years. Um, my question was around just picking up on your, you emphasizing the protection factor within our biodiversity, biosecurity portfolio, and um, your reference to our project Meurudako, which is that restoration regeneration program. And I agree, it hasn't been well um, communicated what's actually within that program, but there is a diversity of um, where the intention is not only planting, but enrichment planting, predator control, fencing to protect. Within that vein, would you, the expenditure that we do have for that program, would you prefer that that was solely for protection or do you think there is always capacity there for that, that restoration and new plantings? Um. There's always going to be room for both, but under your watch, you don't want those remnant patches disappearing off the geography of Canterbury. You know, when you have some amazing river terraces, you have a, the last of the dry land areas in Canterbury out in the West Melton zone, and, um, you know, wetlands is the classic 
Um, so it's going to be a mix. It's, it's hard for me to comment, Lan, without seeing the specifics. But I mean, they're both important, but you can carry on um, doing the activities you mentioned for another 10 years. But if you haven't protected that patch and it's gone, it's gone. You don't get it back. Thank you, Councillor uh, Edge, Councillor Clearwater, then Councillor Elizabeth Mackenzie. Thanks, Jay. I just want to pick up on your um, comment regarding um, in your submission, ditching Ma and um, those other dilution mechanisms. Um, do you do you think there's some urgency in Environment Canterbury to um, provide a wee bit more due diligence and research uh, in the groundwater space uh, before we uh, contemplate doing any more of those things? Uh, indeed, I do, which is why I specifically mentioned it. I called it out in my submission. Um, we have an amazing balance going on underneath us. And I mean, if we stuff it up, you, again, you don't get it back. And it's an unknown um, aquifer, as I understand it. Each aquifer can have its own species residing within it. Uh, we don't know what they are. We don't know if we're pouring new ones in from other source. So um, I think it's our responsibility. And in a way, it's somewhat groundbreaking. But if not in Canterbury, where on earth are you going to do it in New Zealand? Because we've got the greatest sources of groundwater for New Zealand. Um, you look overseas and... Uh, you know, they've stuffed up the giant aquifer in the US. Um, we need to make sure we protect our groundwater here. And it has implications for Christchurch City's drinking water. Um, it's, it was an, it's an amazing opportunity before you start a project to do some baseline work. And seemingly, we didn't take that opportunity. Thanks, Jane. Uh, could I just remind councillors, no leading questions, please. Testament of clarification, although that was a great answer, Jane. Thank you. Councillor Fairwater. Thank you, Jane. Um, you've given put out quite a few challenges, and so, especially with option one, there's a, a lot of funding is required, as, we, as we've been asking people. So, but I just want to ask you specifically around the concept of, of borrowing for natural capital, which can be seen as operational given that the, uh, the government have changed the rules, so borrowing for natural capital is allowed. So I just wonder what your view would be on, on us, say, borrowing for operational or natural capital in order to fund some of the big projects. I would anticipate that approval to uh, to do that was not given without due consideration of potential outcomes. So I, I don't know much about it um, per se, Councillor Clearwater, but um, it's new territory. And I really am not in a position to make a comment one way or the other. Thank you. Jane, we're just about the end of it. Um, thank you. Um, I, hopefully you're going to continue with your work, which is always appreciated by us. And um, yeah, a few less size, Jane, maybe. <laughs> OK, so the next presenter is uh, uh, Bernie Gulder and then Jim Lapsley, then Ian Cumming. Bernie. Uh, th thank you, Mr. Chair. Yes, I have got more words written than I've time to speak, and also there's more words written than in my initial submission. And I wonder if I may hand these out now. Or... Thank you. Uh, Mr. Core, if I just say to you that we, if you can highlight it, if you don't think you've got enough time, you just highlight those points. We will go through and read them. 
and they will be part of our consideration. So, uh, but you'll get a wee bell at nine minutes, and uh, then you'll have another minute, and then we'll have some questions. So that, where you go, and your button. Appreciate that. Thank you. Uh, and thank you for the uh, opportunity to speak this afternoon. Uh, my name is Bernard Calder. Um, been battling for the outdoors and environment for most of my time, but uh, perhaps the most in my better years from when I was say 25 to 40, and I got a little bit tired and knocked my head against the wall, brick wall of uh, or the, the wall of the um, catchment boards and others. So uh, I got back to a normal normal life in, for many years including uh, working at the City Council, the last five years of which was with their water and wetlands engineering section. I just dabbled with environmental issues now and again since then. But knowing that you're, uh, you were uh, having a, a new plan with a, uh, a revised direction, um, I thought I would Hop in and put my thoughts towards it on this occasion. I'll skip through a lot of what I've got here, but just to say uh, I'm pleased to see the new prescriptions that appear to follow on from the essential freshwater package of the government. Um, sort of agree with most of what has been um, written in these little prescriptions that were prefixed with LOS. I don't know what that means, but I uh, pretty well agree with all, all of them, except there's one uh, LOS 13 uh, list under biosecurity, what success looks like on pages 36 and 37. It mentions statutory obligations. Uh, they look pretty good, but I think it should be more prominent mention given to um, the use of Section 6 of the RMA. Um, I consider that uh, farming businesses have had a fair suck of the sand regarding development permissions over the last 70 years or so. And it should be made clear that further conversions of indigenous habitat are unlikely to be in the regional or national interest. Any applications for further conversions of indigenous habitat should be processed using the preservation protection aspects of Section 6 to the fullest. Of course, applications for track construction, fencing, pond, other um, essential things for farm operations should not be unreasonably withheld, and rate relief should be considered if an applicant is prepared to enter protective covenant agreements as an alternative to develop. In my casual observations over the last 50 years or so, I've witnessed continuous deterioration in hill country native vegetation. Thanks, Peninsula accepted, I'm pleased to say. Shrinking wetland areas, deteriorating lake water quality, and in the case of smaller rivers and streams in particular, both shrinking river flows and deteriorating water quality. The Land Development Encouragement Loan Scheme from 1978 to the 1980s gobbled up about 5% of the country's land area, with consequent losses to our biodiversity. And lately, we've had a great water grab for dairy with associated development of more marginal lands. Also, according to David Mitchell of the Press, some 2,000 hectares of riverbed has gone to private hands. All this loss, despite regional councils and their catchment board predecessors, in theory anyway, having a duty of care towards the environment. So I'm welcoming of the new direction towards water and land. Now, I did send in a lot of images to, um, to your staff. They don't seem to be appearing, so I'll do my best to um, get by without them. Um, uh, so I'll just carry on with my notes as they refer to some of those images. Um, 
one was a bit of uh, erosion in the old main road going down to into Akaroa, exposed lowest hillsides. Um, I'm concerned for the water quality of our harbours and feel that more needs to be done to minimise soil run. It's almost too late for the Lutheran Harbour, given its history of dredge dumping. But I applaud the efforts to try and improve the situation here through the Littleton Harbour catchment management plan. The most important, I think, or uh, disturbing slide I have, and uh, they may be able to drag up for people later, considered uh, was of the Mossburn area, Harper Road, up towards the Harper River, head up to Lake Coleridge. I visited there with, I think it was Andrew Dobson of the university about 1980. At that time, it was university endowment land, but I think, and it, it functioned something like the old 99 or less, less of perpetuity, but I think it has been freeholded. And uh, one slide and I'll go Google Earth in 2007 showed um, cultivation starting up near to these marvellous wetlands, boglands in the Mossburn area. Um, there was another Google Earth reproduction I had which showed the develop, developing surrounding the core wetland areas with loss of biodiversity and hydrological buffering. And there was large areas of winter feed planted near sensitive bog and bog areas, um, including a, a adjacent to a pond near Lake Henrietta, where it looked to me that muddy runoff could get into the wetlands. How did that get by the rules? Sorry, you can't see the pictures. And who he can allow that to happen in the last 10 years or so? Uh, a little bit. I had a couple of pictures of pines up on Stag and Spay area on the Inland Road, um, before and after pictures of logging. I was there on one of the first trips through after the Kaikoura earthquake, um, but I was in the convoy, couldn't take a photo. So uh, it was just a sea of mud, and it was the next time I visited also. This, the East Coast North Island and Kaiteri Terry debris disasters. Is that one minute? Right, gotta go. Um, um, seeing what's happened to the clarity of water in the Marlborough Sounds has convinced me we should be very careful where pines are planted. Uh, I did have a video of uh, jet skis in the change topic uh, in the um, Lower Waimakariri, there's definitely a need um, for motion cams, real-time remote access, Stuart Scully near the boat launch of places and a lot of other places. I'll just finish off to say I'm very disappointed in the last two years with an experience with ECAM um, consent officers. It's uh, work that was to be done uh, on behalf of Nectar, which is the same as we had skirt here from Nation Hall, uh, local bodies in contracts, etc. Uh, so earthquake slip materials supposed to be put on private land. They mucked up their plans. The consent officer said, oh, it's okay if you put it in the riverbed. Three thousand, well, it was actually about 11,000 cubic metres. I can really? We're going, to, really, we're going to have to stop you there because we, we're going to go over it and uh, there might be some questions around the table. Can I just say this is a bit difficult because we haven't got your photos to follow this. We will make sure we'll make sure we'll make sure that we do get those and that we do get the big pun. We do get those achievements under our community. That we do get those and we do follow through on this. But I take it the tenor of what you're saying here is that you're you're, you're unhappy with the way um, that the environment is being treated by others, and you want us to be a bit more stringent than that. Is that that the tenor of what you're trying to say here? Your button, Bernie, please. 
your bump, sorry. And uh, congratulations for uh, apparently taking on a, a new direction. Sorry for the fact that we haven't been able to follow that, but we will make it our business to do that, and we will get back to you on LOS. LOS is levels of service. I've talked to the, uh, the chief executive, and we will contact you on that in terms of the meaning in our documents. You're welcome. Um, now we've got Jim Laps. Jim Lapsley, and Jim's got a, a written, some more written material here, Jim, that we're going to hand around. Yes, please. Yeah. Right. Good to go. Um, thank you very much for the opportunity to have my say um, to you guys. Um, like the previous speakers, um, I've written out far too much for 10 minutes, so I'm going to abbreviate it as much as I can. Um, but my submission is very simple. I just want to bring awareness to ECAN. Canterbury Regional Council of the increased uh, riverbed levels in the Waimakariri River and the potential for that to uh, turn into a flood. It's got other consequences um, <clears throat> from that riverbed level rising. Um, so I'll just read out a few, a few of my uh, points here. Um, my submission concerns the riverbed level in the river in the vicinity of State Highway 1 motorway bridge. In short, I consider that the riverbed level has risen significantly over a long period of time, and this is contributing to adverse effects for recreational users of the river. It's also increasing the potential for major flooding about the lands adjoining and nearby the lower portions of the river. In my view, Flood risk is increasing due to the steady rise of the riverbed level. I'm very confident of the rising riverbed levels due to both anecdotal and factual evidence that I'll outline below. Um, the jet boat in Canterbury access ramp is immediately upstream of the motorway bridge and it provides an extremely good reference feature for the riverbed uh, water levels. The concrete ramp was erected in 1976 and it was after much investigation and research, the ramp location was selected and the ramp constructed, taking into account the flow and depth of water in that location. Um, so I'm making this submission just personally, but I am supported by uh, Jet Boat in Canterbury. So if you've all got this, um, this submission here, if you turn over to the, the back uh, page, I've got a um, 1991 Canterbury Regional Council floodplain management plan. And if you turn over to the uh, page where it's got the arrows on it, it said the plan is the result of four years of work by the council staff, assisted by an independent technical advisory group, which reviewed and analysed the initial investigatory research on the plan's uh, progress. Outside technical expertise was used uh, where needed. A 16-member community advisory committee representing a range of community viewpoints uh, was also involved. And um, under the flood plan management options, number five, development of gravel extraction is ticked off on every single option. Um, it says here that the uh, plan three was their best option and continuing gravel extraction below cross rank to reduce the build-up of the riverbed. So if you go to the um, pictures I've got, and photo number one and two shows pretty graphically how much um, the riverbed has risen. Photo number one was in 1992. Um, we don't know the actual river flow, but I took a photo just a couple of days ago um, on photo number two, and that's only at there was 49 cumex, which is the river, that's very low flow level. Uh, on, on the next page, you can see photo uh, three and four, and you can see the, the pile caps on the uh, under the bridge. In photo three, you can clearly see um, 
at least half of the pile cap. The photo four, it's pretty well nearly underwater. Just illustrating how much the riverbed has risen. Photo five and six shows 1974, um, what the, uh, the vegetation was like around the, the, our ramp area. That's, these photos are in the same area. And number six, it's got all these massive willow trees right down through there. And about two hours ago, I just got a photo from Graham Raxworthy from 1971, again showing the pile caps under the bridge. Um, he said that was at high tide and you can see the still water around his uh, boat trailer. Graham said the flounders could be seen between the two bridges and at low tide, the piles under the pile caps could be clearly seen. So um, I'm no Da Vinci, but I drew a bit of an article in the back there too, but uh, <clears throat> yeah, I'll never get a prize for art. So um, back to the second page, item number seven, I went into the uh, river engineers um, and got the Environment Canterbury do cross surveys across the river. And I got the survey results for the cross section immediately below the motorway bridge. Uh, in 2012, it was 0.96 of a metre above sea level. That's the riverbed aggregate, not the water level, the riverbed aggregate. In 2019, it was 1.88 metres above sea level. So if you extrapolate that out, we estimate there's been 25 years of absolute minimal um, aggregate extraction out of the riverbed. You could take it um, as given that there's probably three metres of riverbed aggregate rise in that section of the river. Um, so I, I'm not a, an expert on this. Um, you guys have got fantastically qualified river engineers, but all I'm trying to raise awareness is that the riverbed has risen significantly. I estimate that um, that three metre rise, the river travels at um, about 15 kilometres an hour in a flood, that's 625 cubic metres per second on top of any flood that comes down. So you guys have got a problem with um, potential of uh, flooding Christchurch and Kaiapoi. Um, the, the rights cut was um, proposed in 1865. It was finally put through in uh, 1930 to uh, stop the river going out through the South Branch um, and out through Ka the Kaiapoi River. And it's, um, it's rising so much that it's likely to go back down through those channels again if, if you're not careful. So that's my... Uh, um, brief outline. Um, the actions I'd request is that you guys have a serious look at how much gravel is coming out of there and get the riverbed level back down to the um, rights cut level, which was specifically put through there to stop flooding into Christchurch and Kaiapoi. Um, have a chat to um, Jet Boat News uh, Canterbury because our ramp is, is now virtually a, a huge problem for us. It was great for about 30 years, but now the riverbed's come up so much that um, it's getting to a, a dangerous point. It, it, it creates a berm um, in the riverbed that jet boats can't get out past. And I've seen some idiots just blast their way over the shallow water straight out into the river. And there's other boats that use that area coming and going. And it's going to be a, an accident. There's one more thing. Uh, some of our older members can recall um, the tidal interchange between the high tide and the river used to be above the motorway bridge. It's now way back down about the um, the old highway bridge and there's a serious problem um, with undercurrents around that area and there's been so many drownings in that area um, as a consequence of the, um, the river uh, the riverbed rising and it's it's um, combined with the piles of the old bridge is creating that undercurrent. There's been multiple, multiple drownings there. And I've got an example of that in my submission. So that's basically it. Thank you, Jim, and thank you for the photos and the 
in the history. That's 1991, which um, I haven't seen that before, so that's good to see. So questions, Councillor Ian McKenzie. Uh, Jim, just to, uh, you say you're submitting on your own, but you are a member of the Jet Boat Association, is that? Yes. Yeah, that, 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 and that's where you get a lot of your information. Yes, yeah, not uh, Oh, thank you very much for coming in and making this really important uh, submission to us about the protection of, our, of Christchurch and, and uh, Kaipo areas. I think it's a really good, obs excellent observations to assist us. Um, I'm just wondering, um, has your Jet Boat Association got any comments to make about the situation at the Waimakariri Lagoon in that area? No, Right. So you mainly go upstream. Yeah. There's a lot of jet boaters who are non members that go down to that area, but I'm, I'm only a member of the uh, jet boating Canterbury. We've got 2,300 members, and um, there's only about 30% of the people who use our ramp are members of Jet Boating Canterbury or Jet Boating New Zealand. So we're actually paying for maintenance of that ramp on behalf of all jet boaters, even though it's on ECAN land. Uh, we own the concrete, but you guys um, own the rest of the land. Thank you. I really appreciate you coming in. Thanks very much. Thank you. Any other questions? Okay, thanks, Jim. Thanks for your submission. Just a process, Eric. Uh, can you hear me? You're online. Uh, we can see you. You're prominent in the council chamber, but we've probably got about three three goes before you. So I don't know whether you want to um, turn your camera off, probably, uh, because you're very prominent. I'm not saying we don't like looking at you, but you know, we're going to do. Uh, so next is uh, Ian Cumming, then Lin Lindsay Carswell. And then Eric, so you're probably 20 minutes away, Eric. Good afternoon, and thank you for allowing me. I won't be taking 10 minutes. I think I'll probably be taking about two. Now, you've read my submission, which is a, a brief history of the service that Beckenham used to, uh, used to have and how it was destroyed by uh, inept, really, uh, decisions. And we get um, something like the 115, which required people to wait an hour for the next bus and then wait at Sydenham to collect, connect. But so if we, if we went back earlier than that, um, there was an innovative service that um, the Huntsbury bus continued down, uh, went up to Huntsbury, came down Major Aiken Road and made a great big loop which went through Sydenham, which made probably a more interesting ride for the drivers, actually. Um, and... Um, And yes, earlier than that, um, like many of these suburban services you've got now, they don't stop at the interchange, they go through. And, and our Beckenham service used to go all the way through to Bishopdale. So basically, my, my submission is a plea to restore a, a, a service to the heart of Beckenham, which we used to have. The population is more than it used to be. Uh, and we've got more, more people at the old people's home or new villas down there, more children. Um, so that, that's an enough. I want to have a serious, serious look and, and trying to work something that would take the bus route through uh, Beckenham, uh, through um, Birdwood Avenue, up Norwood, through uh, up to um, slightly circular Huxley and then round, in fact, end up at the um, interchange. Uh, so that's basically all I want to say, but I, I, I want to make a couple of points here. Masks. I was in Dunedin last weekend and I had took about four trips on the bus. Everybody, including the driver, bar one, on all those buses was like this. And then I'm in town here in Christchurch, and you're lucky if you've got three people out of 20 wearing it, and as often as not, the bus drivers aren't. So the mandated wearing of masks in Christchurch needs a needs, we probably need a slight lockdown or something to people get them out of their complacency. Um, and now the the innovation of the, the colour of the um, of the buses. Uh, what you've done now, uh, we used to have all red. I didn't see that as a problem. What you've done, and I think it's very clever, is there are very large signs now. They're all the same buses, but I would suggest it all ought to be in in um, uh, uppercase. 
So we've got Beckenham, not Beckenham, um, Kashmir, Big C, and small. It would fit and make it even easier, harder for, for hard of hearing, hard of seeing people. Um, so look at that to increase the size of the lettering, but it won't force it to be squeezed to one side. And the other thing is, I was just going to end up by saying um, that I scored for this organisation once upon a time. Didn't get in, but you can see that I was going fast, free and frequent. Now, we've got, we're getting fast, we've got frequent, and I think I saw somewhere in that uh, long-term long plan you could be looking at free. So I encourage you in your long-term thing to think about free, fast and frequent and think of Ian Cumming, who still travels on the bus pretty well every day, and I know that route. But I might have to say just, just finally about... I walk down to get the number one bus, and I'm finding it harder at my age now. I, I, it takes seven going on eight minutes to get there without without trying to puff. So that's all I want to say. Bring it back, please. Thank you, Ian. Uh, thank you for that. Um, there's no decisions we can make on putting a bus down that road, but we will consider your submission. Lyle. Thank you, Ian, um, and thanks for picking up on the free bus investigation um, aspect. And I'm interested, um, when you ran for council, how did you propose to fund free buses? And has that changed, you know, between now? Like, do you have any thoughts? Oh, you put your button on. <laughs> did it? Oh, I'm sorry. When did it... Oh, I see. I didn't realise that. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, okay, yeah, absolutely. I, I thought it was still still live. No, this was way back in transport board days. Um, and I remember that uh, there were certain major cities in the world that had free transport at that time, and I would have presented that had I got as far as getting on. But you can't beat politics, you see. You can't beat... No, that's right. Um, there's some progressive councillors, I guess, that have got that in the back of their mind, but we'll see how we go on that end. So... Um... If there's no more questions, thank you for coming in. Um, you, slightly more than two minutes, but enjoyable. Well, I've got you back on track, I think, time-wise, perhaps. Thank you. <laughs> Lindsay Castle. Lindsay, you're up next. And then... And, he's, and Lindsay, you've got a handout that's going around. Some notes. And Eric, I suppose, if you can hear me, Eric, you're next after Lindsay. Oh, Sean Parker is here too. Good afternoon, everybody. My name's Lindsay Carswell. Um, I'm a retired school teacher and I taught economics and accounting for a number of years. For senior students, that's year 13 or seven forms. And I have a Bachelor of Commerce degree from the University of Canterbury. First of all, I want to say that I support option one regarding the implementation of the uh, national policy statement on fresh water. Where I disagree, however, is that I do not agree that the costs of that implementation should be part of the general charge. And the reason why I'm saying that, that is, I believe, I consider it to be unreasonable and unfair to charge people fee or a charge for something that neither created or benefited financially from. I think it's important. The notes I've handed out that have been handed out, I just want to go over a couple of things, a bit of research over the weekend, Uncle Google, about various organisations commenting on the polluter pays principle. The first one is a piece there from the London School of Economics. And the second piece by the organisations, the OECD, the Organisation for Economic and Community Development. <clears throat> Both of these organisations argue in favour that the polluter pays principal. <clears throat> London School of Economics, just probably the sense out there, those who produce the pollution to bear the cost of management and prevention, the damage, etc., etc., to human 
health and for the environment. The OECD one's quite interesting. <clears throat> the sentence said, now that the polluter pays principal, must be regarded as a mainstay of membership countries' environmental policies. New Zealand is a member of the OECD. And there's the OECD saying that it should be the mainstay of doing it. And that policy document there, actual fact, was written in 1972. It's been around almost 50 years. Now, <clears throat> I'm not going to talk about the economics of pollution, the terminology that's used. Some of you will know them, what they're saying, and some of you have probably never heard of them. It's called externalities, <clears throat> where social costs and private costs and so on. It's quite, quite an interesting topic actually to look into. <clears throat> um, but as I said, the experts around who you'll have will know all about those sorts of things. Also, I'm not going to go into the, the pollution itself because I'm not an environmentalist. So I have no science training in that area. But the key point I want to really say is that those that cause the pollution should pay. That's a clear message I want you to take on board. I think it is grossly unfair. For instance, I notice with transport, people of Christchurch pay the bulk of it, and so they should. The rural areas don't. Um, I noticed that your water user charges, this is note two, you used to charge the, the water monitoring and everything as part of a general charge. And that was important. Now I see it is on a user pays basis, as it should be. And that's about all that really I want to say, but there's really interesting articles there. Um, I actually emailed all this through and I hope that you might have had it, actually had it sent to you. If you want to um, Google any of these links I've given here, you can always get in contact with me and I can email you the original documents so you can um, copy and paste them. I think it would be a bit of a nightmare trying to copy all those letters out. You'll be here for the next couple of years trying to figure out where you've gone wrong. But anyway, that's it. That's all I want to say. Hey, Lindsay, thank you very much for that. And that's probably a good idea that we do that exchange that email and somebody here on your way out will be able to help you with that. But we've got a question from uh, Councillor Sunkel. Thank you for that, and I don't think anyone disagrees with our polluter pays. But I, I'd just like some enlightenment from you on externality. So we have externality for both the demand of the and, and the other side of the equation, and they're positive and negative. How do we balance that equation if we only focus on on one of those externalities and, and not balance up the positive side as well. I, I really, it's a typical one to answer. I needed a bit more research for myself. You know, there are, I know there are um, positive externalities like a um, rural person um, fencing off streams and doing all that sort of work and, and planting trees around rivers. That's a positive. But it's, it's the negatives which are over, which are dominating all this at this stage. Thank you for that. Um, I guess the challenge from Councillor Sunkel may be to start your career over again <laughs> and write some papers for it. But thank you for coming in and making those points to us. Some Somebody will catch you on the way out and get that link from you. And uh, yeah, thank you for showing up. So our next two presenters are online um, and they are Eric Duff. Are you there, Eric? Here he comes. Yes. Your microphone, maybe. Eric, is it on? Is that better? Yeah, you can go now. Thank you. Um, I'm just in my second year farming out in the back of Mayfield, dry land sheep and beef farm. 
And I want to voice my concern about the 92% increase in our rates, which is which is deemed unfair and directed at agriculture in an intensive area in Mid Canterbury. Uh, I've researched the rate calculator on the ECAM website and in my old flat in Christchurch, it's um, got an increase of two to three percent of about 70 bucks. I searched the farm and wine matters increased by 16 percent and we're obviously hit with a 92 percent increase which is my main point I want to get across. This rate, this increase doesn't include our local water scheme, which will get overhauled because it, we're on a permanent bore water notice and it, we can't afford to keep it running. So we're lumped with that cost as well with the new fresh water regulations. Um, I've also read in the articles and advertised that all the rates are lifting by 24 to 18%. But, I mean, that's not true or fair. A lot of farmers locally don't fully understand how serious the rate rises are and don't actually know um, that they're right. A lot of people think they're 8%, not 80. They, you know, a lot of people have actually laughed at me when I said the word 80%. They said, no, it'll be 8. I hope that, I hope that it is 8 I hope that someone put an extra zero on there just by accident. But, um, lastly, oh, there are a few other things I want to talk about. With obviously the nitrates are the big issue on reasons why our rates are going up, and climate change is obviously another one, which is not an environmental Canterbury issue. It's a head government issue, and we need direction from the government. It's not the council's job to be sorting out the climate. Um, we've tested our nitrates in our water locally and they're all around 2 or 2.2. The highest was a well that was beside the Rangitata River and we're farming right on the Rangitata River. So the water coming out of the Rangitata Gorge was the highest out of our three testing sites, which was the Montaldo Water Scheme and a cafe Lushington's Cafe in Tinwall, which was um, two. The well was 2.2 and the Montaldo water scheme was 1.9. I don't think there's enough data to increase our rates when, when the data's not there. I don't think throwing money at it is the answer. It's, too, it's, a, it's a too large an increase to handle all that money efficiently. It needs to be small increases at once. Um, yeah, and yeah, and lastly, I mean, yeah, we've been subsidised through the 80s. We lost our subsidies. Farmers either went broke or they tried to survive by intensifying their operations. Irrigation came to Mid Canterbury and we've um, intensified, and that was under an ECAN umbrella and under a government umbrella. Now we're getting punished by 92% and that's not even getting water to our farm. Um, yeah, that's, that's my point, I think. I've got most of my point across. Yeah, Eric, thank you. Uh, look, it's pretty difficult on this medium, but uh, thank you for taking the time and and making those points to us, and especially when you're a second year farmer. Now, we've got questions. Is there any questions? Councillor McKenzie, Ian McKenzie. Uh, thanks, Duffy. Um, the, the bore down in Tinwood you refer to, do you know how deep that is? 17 metre well. The water was tested by Mayfield Hines. Thank you. Anybody else? Uh, Councillor Hands. Hi Eric, how are you? Um, just just a question in terms of what it means for you. Have you explain or clarify for us if this rates rise went ahead with the ninety percent, what impact does that have on you as a young farmer? Four thousand dollars. Four thousand dollars and that doesn't pay for my stock water or my drinking water. I can't even drink the tap water. We're on a permanent boil water notice. So we've got 
challenges of getting stock water and drinking water to our farm to meet the freshwater regulations. But I mean, the four thousand dollars that I paid Ecan won't do that. So yeah, yeah. does that answer your question? Thanks, Eric. Okay, Eric. Uh, thank you for taking the time again, and I think we'll let you go. Get back to farming. Um, thank you. But thank you. Thank you for taking the time. Okay. Be order. The next, uh, I think we've got Sean. Sean Baker. Sean, are you online, Sean? Uh, yes, I am. Well, when you're ready, Sean, you can go ahead. Okay. Um. So, so my name is Sean Baker. I'm a student at Lincoln. I'm studying a Bachelor of Environmental Management. Um, so main, today I'm mainly going to talk about the transport proposals that I talked about in my submission. submission. I'm just going to start by saying that I support option one, the 24%. Likewise, the main reason I support it, I believe that it can, it's important that ECAN has the resources to fight against climate change and for environmental derogation. We've only got nine years left to make massive reductions in our emissions and it's very important that we start, start have access to clean water water we have seen that how if we continue to derogate derogate we we'll, we'll lose more species and our diversity will be at more risk. So I'm gonna start by talking about the my my ray. Um, I'm not a resident of Timaru but I do believe it should stay but because having read how pos the positive feedback has got in the Timaru area, and I think it's best we continue to build those build those strengths rather than from now on. Um, I, and I'm, I believe it should be expanded to other areas around Calvary. I think a lot of areas may stay have stayed small in population, but they have. But overall, they have grown. Most areas are main landmarks like your supermarkets and crossroads not at, they take longer than 15 minutes to 15 minute walk and that could be very difficult for people who have health issues disabled all that so and i think for people who do in a lot of areas especially do not have good walking and cycling infrastructure especially between small city small towns and small towns so i think a lot of, for people who can't depend on other Transportation, they practically are stranded. I also believe that introducing my way to other small towns will help reduce small distance trips, which are responsible for one third of total car trips and emit more carbon emissions than longer car journeys. And it also, and especially in the Sal and my recovery districts, it can be used as a feeder bus system. So people who do live a bit further out from towns like Lincoln and Wollaston, they may live that may live in farms and all that and they want to use public transport they may be able to access it more easily and it reduces the amount of cars parked around like bus and white park and white facilities and major suburban bus stops another another thing i talked about i talked about rapid transit so i um, i believe that could stitch as a rapid that is a big huge priority in the next 10 years especially with car congestion in the greater crisis area growing. And I think if we don't do anything, we're going to start to experience what we've seen in Auckland and Wellington. So, so I propose so like a five year commuter rail trial, especially from Wollaston to Rainy and Yorua, and all with a BLT route throughout the um, Middle of the city and more express buses in Kaipoi and Lincoln. Lincoln, and I think the reason, and I think while I welcome the um, rapid transit business case that's currently been done, I think something should be done now while before it gets because by the time before it gets organised, we organise it, could be a chance of congestion will get worse. So, um, so, so I talked a bit about. How much it may cost based on I based on the ECAN study that was done in 2014 and and the council's previous business case into Cumia Rail that was published in an article in the press last November 
using the figures from near, a possible a, a estimated cost could be around 101 million. I, I think it could be achieved very easily um, to hurry up the open to Hamilton's well, so it shows how easy it could be done with existing infrastructure. So I will, so it shows it can be achievable, and it helps get and helps that mode begin now, and it helps as we start playing this rapid transit network. We can actually see what works well and what does not. I want to talk a little bit about funding, particularly fares. I believe it should be less dependent on fare revenue as the primary contributor. Um, as long as every Fears keep increasing. Increasing it makes public transport more attractive. Attractive to many people. Cost is a major barrier to many people. It's people, and I, and I believe we should move more to a flat fear system. If you read, if you read my map, and this is I've proposed like a distance based fear where someone pays like a dollar in a zone, and then as across another zone, they pay two dollars, and then Make and it will make it very easy for people, make it more attractive to people get into public transport and help people get, a, get around. And it shows the massive savings to many people based on the current bus fears. And I do, and I do believe that ECAN should lobby for more subsidies from the NZTA to at least cover maybe six, at least sixty percent of cost. Because we have like the, the central government and the in the campaign in twenty seventeen have one hundred million have committed to one hundred million dollars of funding wherever that could be used, but that could but based on the figures that I got from my community from the community Rail trial, it will cover the um it should cover the funding of the trial. Okay, um that's pretty much it. Thanks for listening. <laughs> Hey, thank you, Sean. It's great to see the amount of work you're putting here. There's dollars here and there's roots here and there's all sorts of stuff here. So that's a really good resource for us to look at. Uh, Councillor Ian McKenzie has a question. Uh, th th thanks, John. I, uh, Sean. I, I, I note that you uh, think we should not pay, we should, shouldn't take as much from fares. Uh, how are you proposing to fund, uh, other than uh, increasing the subsidy from government, how are you proposing to fund all this transport cost? But obviously, but obviously, sorry. Um, but obviously, like said, besides more central government support, support, like we support, we also will have, like, like said, there are some money, of course, in other areas, like said, like said, from right, and all that. I think it's, I, I think it's, I, I like it, uh, that can fill in the void. Void, other work, etc. etc. I think it's just very important that very important. I think, like I said, we still get some fair revenue based on the system. I think if more people use it, you, you would generally get more money out of it. I think, it's, I think it's very important if we really want to start seeing this mode shift. That we start mode shift, we start making it. I think, like I said, cost is a, is a barrier and it helps. People get and if people use it more frequently, more money will be generated through the fear system. So it's a mix of mix, it's a it's sort of mix of sixty percent central government and forty percent from other areas, including including Bahrain or right. But I think it's very important in the long run that one to I think the benefits in the long run is that mode shift and social and the environmental and health benefits that does create for people here in Christchurch. <laughs> hey, hey, thank you, Sean. Uh, we've got another question from Councillor Farm. Kia ora, Sean. Thanks so much for your submission. Um, I really just want to pick up on the points you make about acting urgently across all these aspects of your submission. So, yes, transport is a key one, but you've also picked up on climate change and biodiversity and the like. Um, one view that we're, you know, hearing at the table today and yesterday um, is to be quite conservative with our expenditure, particularly in light of COVID. And I just wanted, I wondered if you wanted to um, comment from your perspective whether you think that 
financial conservatism is needed at this time? Or could you expand on that? I'm sure. I think I think no one can deny it's, it's a tough time right now. But I think, but I think sometimes it, but I think sometimes like like I say, we've only got nine years left to like to prevent the effects of climate change, climate change, and like sometimes it's not sometimes it's not best to play the safe safe option. I think if we really want to see this change, we really need to commit us need to commit to spending. And it may sound a lot of money right now, but I think it's very important. But I think the stock benefits we get in the long run outweigh that. I think it's very important that we invest in projects that do create many benefits to pe people and else's people here in Canterbury. Canterbury. So I think we should more see what the more look of it. What what how is it going to how is it going to help people here in Canterbury? How is it going to protect our environment? If it's gonna do, if it's gonna make major difference, I, we should invest we should invest down that road. Road that's pretty much how I'll probably see if you see it through how how much of a difference it's gonna make and make to people in our environment. Mm -hmm. Hey Sean, thank you. We're just about out of time for this now, so but thank you for coming online and doing that. Thank you for your submission and all the time you've put into it. Uh, and we'll take your um, submission once we do our determination on where we head forward. So thank you. Yeah, thank you for having me. <laughs> OK, councillors, we're back here at Hubbard Three, and the Hubbard Three submission is uh, Christchurch City Council. Uh, welcome to the submission process for LTP. I think we're waiting on one. So you can make a start if you like. Yeah, yes, push, just push the button. Right, sir. Kia ora, good afternoon. Um, thank you for the opportunity to be here. Um, I notice I've caught you just after a tea break, so hopefully that's a, a good thing. Um, and I'm noting the temperature in this room. I'm guessing that you guys are trying to pretend it's still summer or something. My um, walk over from the city um, was through cold air, so I'm, I'm certainly feeling the benefit of the the warmth in this room. But um, we, um, I'll start with some introductory general comments. Um, we certainly welcome the opportunity to be heard in support of our submission on your long-term plan. Um, our councils actually face many of the same challenges as we're developing work programs and budgets over the next 10 years. And we need to meet those challenges against the backdrop of significant reforms that we're all aware of, um, obviously local government, water, planning, um, and health obviously is the latest one of, of those four as well. So we're, we're faced with planning for the next 10 years in a rapidly reforming and potentially significantly changing environment. So it's vital that we work together um, and it's vital that we as the City Council recognise that Environment Canterbury are helping to coordinate and lead many of the collaborations, much of the work that will actually end up, we hope, um, delivering solutions for our region. So having made those general remarks, I'll now refer to some more specific issues. Both of our long-term plans emphasise the importance of climate change action, reducing greenhouse gas emissions, and better understanding the impacts of climate change. We're investing significantly to support the uptake of public transport in Greater Christchurch, and it's important to continue collaborating with all of our partners to maximise the investment of the to maximise the um, value of the investment that we are making in our long-term plan and that you're proposing to make in yours. We need transformational change in the transport networks, which connects the city and the region to meet our climate goals and, in fact, to improve the well-being of our communities, providing accessible and affordable low-emission travel options. And this is going to be crucial to achieving our climate change and other objectives. Urban form, of course, is also key to reducing emissions and driving change in travel choices and, in fact, driving changes in the need for travel. We need to plan our city and, in fact, the sub-region so that communities live closer to the services, to the infrastructure, to the activities that they want to access. The link between transport and urban development um, needs to be front and centre 
of the transport conversation and cannot be underestimated. Water is the next area that I'd like to refer to. And it's another area where we need to keep working together as councils and also with the community on water issues. There are new and recently amended national environmental standards and national policy statements that we need to implement. And we support robust science and strong compliance monitoring that gives effect to Te Mana o Te Wai. We're also working with you on groundwater and our submission notes particular concern that the emerging trend of rising concentrations of nitrates across the region, regions, and we would welcome clarification of your strategy for addressing this. And I'll point out that this is a particular concern that's been the subject of quite a lot of discussion um, at the City Council and on our submission that we um, have lodged to your NCP. Your consultation document seeks feedback on systems like the Heinz Managed Aquifer Recharge Project. And whilst we welcome this system as a way to address existing contamination, we would far prefer that you support investment decisions that seek to avoid contamination of water bodies in the first place. On biodiversity, we support your biodiversity initiatives and the plans that you've got to better to get a better understanding of biodiversity trends and the um, impacts of various work streams in the region. And we also note the importance of dry land ecosystems as well as the wetlands, which are well referenced in your consultation document. You're obviously planning to do a lot of work in the biodiversity space, and that's something that we support. Community resilience. We're very keen that work on the Canterbury Regional Policy Statement be progressed. Prioritising this will help ensure regional work and the Council's work on coastal hazards can better inform each other. Another area where the work that we're each doing um, needs to be done in a joined up way, and we support the work that you're planning to do in that regard. Air quality remains a matter of concern for our Council, and this is exactly the same as we've said in previous long-term plan submissions. This remains a concern. We encourage the provi um, provision of adequate funding for proactive compliance and enforcement of activities impacting on air quality, including quarries. You'll often hear commentary around enforcement action, um, around the quarries, around the um, organics processing plans. We're keen that you resource the um, compliance um, monitoring and any enforcement action that may be required adequately so that it's able to be done effectively. And we also wonder whether it's an option for you to charge more or a higher proportion of the cost of enforcing consents to the consent holders themselves so that those that are driving the need for the activity are bearing some of the costs. Crusher City Council has received clear messages from the community around delivering our core services well, addressing rates affordability, and also investing for the future and bringing new facilities on stream. And there's some of the core planks, some of the foundations of what you see in our own long-term plan. Your draft plan is ambitious, and it puts a clear question to ratepayers on whether you should step up the pace. You'll be reviewing all of the submissions that you've received, as we are for our own LTP. And I and the Council wish you all the best for that process, and thank you again for the opportunity to be heard today. Thank you. Well, thank you, Andrew, and thank you for coming in and being so direct with us in terms of the concerns that you have. And I will uh, reiterate that our relationship is probably as good as it's been since I've been at Council. So um, congratulations to those people. And the GCP get stronger as we go. So, councillors, questions? Councillor Edge. So the question related to um, your item 30, 34 about um, the, uh, the the budget that, that we have for the regional spatial plan. I just wonder if you could elaborate a wee bit more on your thoughts about that. It's, you're suggesting we haven't got enough funding in the long term plan for that. Yeah. In, in line with the comments I've made on other work, work areas, I think it's essential that work is funded to be delivered um, in the way that it needs to be 
so that we're not seeing um, resource constraints affecting the ability to to do work to do work well or to do it in a timely fashion. So those comments apply to a number of areas in your LTP. And I think the paragraph that you're referring to is another one um, where that really comes into play in the same way. Um, thank you, Deputy um, Mayor Andrew, for coming along and giving a presentation and uh, submitting on our submission. It's really good to um, get your perspective. And um, thank you for saying that we're all working well together because we are. And I think that's really uh, praiseworthy for the whole region, actually, and across Canterbury, but also particularly for the Greater Christchurch Partnership. I'm interested in your comments on. Um, paragraph 37 about the behaviour change that we've referenced under customer marketing and engagement around transport, um, forming our public transport. Um, have you got any ideas? Um, you, you don't normally come to the Greater Christchurch Partnership, but you know we have, we have mentioned it lots of times, but we don't get much traction about it. So I'm wondering if you've got some ideas for us about how we can get some traction around behaviour change. Yes. Certainly. I mean, there have been some challenges, despite the improvements that have been made to public transport routes, public transport networks, public transport infrastructure, there remain some challenges of actually getting people onto public transport. Um, some of the other mode shifts interventions that we've made, the city is far more walkable than it used to be, the city is far more bikeable, bikeable than it used to be, and we are seeing behaviour change in those areas. Um, public transport, um, certainly seems to be one area which is um, more difficult to get people out of their cars and onto the buses. Um, I mean, really, that's about having services that are of the right quality that go from where people want to travel from to where they want to go to in the easiest and most seamless way possible. So minimal changes, direct services, services of the right frequency at times when people want to travel. I know from my own experience, what's got me back onto the bus is the 10 minute frequency on the number 28 in the mornings and the evenings and the express bus from Littleton to Christchurch to the interchange here. Um, that's what's got me back onto the buses. So I think that demonstrates that services going where people want to go at the time they want to travel and quickly and efficiently is what this is all about. Um, I don't know what consideration there is of um, increasing the reach of the network. There are a number of routes that were discontinued by the previous environment Canterbury. Um, and I certainly would welcome, and I know there's been some discussion at our council table around um, re looking at reinstating some of those routes or putting additional routes on where there might be gaps in the network. Um, from my own experience, the 535 from Littleton through to Ferrymead and Eastgate was one of the routes that was discontinued. Um, at the time that we submitted on that, we talked about a route connecting um, log logical connections between um, neighbouring communities um, where people might naturally choose to go rather than necessarily coming right the way into the city. Um, but yeah, I mean, the, the quality, the frequency, um, the confidence that people have got in the service, um, we're certainly committed with our investment in our own LTP to continuing to provide good infrastructure. So that's um, bus lanes, bus stops um, and the other infrastructure that we're responsible for. And certainly we would encourage Environment Canterbury and all of our partners to be investing at the levels that are required to deliver that transformational step change, which is required, particularly in the public transport space. Yeah, good. Uh, sorry, Thank you, and kia ora, Andrew. Um, in regard to air quality, you talk specifically about some source, uh, some point, sort of the discrete issues. Would you be able to offer any comment on general ambient air quality, or do you feel, or what other, just the points that issue? Yeah, I mean, I, I use quarries and the OPP as examples of where there may be a need for um, compliance monitoring and enforcement action. And the point that we make in the submission is that that needs to be adequately resourced in order to be able to be done effectively. Um, so what we're asking for in the submission is that you put adequate resourcing into what's required in order to make sure that compliance monitoring is done effectively and that enforcement action is able to be taken when necessary. Thank you. I was just um, interested in point nine, you talk about Enviro Schools program and um, strongly support that proposed, the proposed um, rates for the uh, Enviro Schools program, but also you say that the council's looking at increasing 
certainty of funding for local delivery and I just wonder how do you feel like the split should be or how um, should there be a more local specific rating for Enviro schools in our in our council region and in the different areas or should it be a more broad across the region how do you how yeah, we hadn't really considered that from a rating point of view. We certainly considered it from a funding support point of view. And this is a matter that um, I expect that we will be considering as a result of long-term plan submissions um, to our own long-term plan. And certainly it's something that um, should be a shared responsibility. Um, I mean, my own personal view is that the City Council should be contributing and Environment Canterbury should be contributing. Um, we didn't get into how that should be rated for, but certainly it should be adequately funded. And I would certainly see it as a shared responsibility across both of our councils to ensure it's able to be delivered effectively. Thank you. Thank you. I actually have two, but the first one's a yes or no. Um, based on your comments around the uh, public transport space. Is the City Council's position that you would uh, support an increased rate, public transport rate outright to increase services? Uh, and the second question is in, sorry, second questions in reference to uh, paragraphs 11 and 12. Uh, are you concerned over at City Council about our shared ratepayers paying twice or perhaps three times for planning work that's required as, as a result of reform, reforms? If you could comment on that. So on the public transport one, again, um, a little bit like my answer to the previous question, um, uh, we haven't discussed whether we believe you should be rating differently for public transport, and it would be wrong in this environment for, for me to offer a, a personal opinion. Um, but certainly you'll see we've made some comments in our written submission about accessibility to public transport, the cost of public transport. We're obviously aware of work that you're doing or planning to do in, in that space around um, free or gold coin or other um, payment mechanisms for, for public transport. We certainly would support anything that makes public transport more accessible, more desirable and that gets more people onto the buses. Um, we didn't get involved in how you should be rating for that. And if you were go to if you were to go to a free transfer free public transport model or reduced cost public transport model, um, obviously those costs need to fall somewhere. Um, but we didn't comment on how you might want to rate for any shortfall that that would provide. And then the second question on um, planning. Um, again, I don't know whether I've really got the required information to answer that question. Well, um, you know, I mean, at a high level. Um, you would expect that um, those applying for consents would uh, would be making payment for those consents that the charging um, would be where the work falls and where the requirement is. Um, but beyond that, um, I'm probably not qualified to to make any particular detailed remarks. And that's fine, and we can fill that gap in if we need to between ourselves and yourself. Yeah. Um, there was one more question. If there's one more question, we'll take one more question. But there doesn't seem to be. So, Andrew, another nice walk back for you. Thanks for coming. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. And now I see we've got um, uh, Councillor Mackay and the and the going to be the next submitter. So Angus, if you wouldn't mind coming to the table once Andrew's departed, thank you. And we're just ready, so you know the rules, Angus, in terms of Louise is in charge. Uh, at nine minutes, if we get there, she'll value. Got one more minute. We're in your hands. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Councillors, can I please make it plain that I'm here as Angus Mackay, not as councillor today? Uh, the Ashburn District Council has its own submission, which you will presumably read in good time. But I'm here on a totally uh, slightly shorter theme. I made a special effort to come here today, councillors, to express my view that the Canterbury Regional Council, ECAN, is not, in my opinion, listening to the whole of the region as well as it could or has done in the past. Personally, I have always made the extra effort to understand Christchurch City and watched the city progress. I understand fully, I believe, the change that the people of Canterbury made for this council at the last election. I have been known on a number of occasions, in public and privately, to
do congratulate chairs, mayors, councillors of this city and of the region on what good decisions and achievements they have made for the total region and especially Christchurch City. Councillors, your great rise is absolutely beyond belief. Page 10, in your document, you say, implementing the government's essential freshwater package, which prescribes the new limits for farming activities and for water quality. Councillors, the government has set the limits and the quality standards. All you have to do is put these into a regional context. I know from experience that the hard grunt work of planning is actually developing the water quality and the standards and the limits that you wish to get to. Government has done that for you in a national policy statement. I remember once I invited Ecan to come to Hackertree where some houses were falling over the cliff and the residents of Hackertree Township wanted to put in some protection. And your staff quite rightly said that the national policy, uh, national policy statement on coastal was it and nothing else could be done. They very carefully explained the standards and the qualities, the, the water the qualities and the quantities of the national policy statement on coastal and the people understood. Count the Ashburn District Council demolished those houses and moved them away and left the coast exactly how it was. There is a saying, councillors, to achieve is the art of the possible. And if you achieve with the people on site with you, I guarantee you will have many more wins. To sting them, make them pay more than what they believe is a fair share will only lose their trust and cause them to scoff at working with ECAN in the future. The voluntary planting of waterways at their own cost, developing mudfish habitat and native planting, a serious question if it will happen to the same extent because they will believe they've already paid through their high rate. I also ask you, to please support the Heinz Plains targeted rate. This rate shows that the people want to achieve a local solution for local people for a finite project. Please take the people with you. I believe you will achieve quicker solutions that are much more sustainable. Thank you, Mr Chairman. Thank you, councillors, for your time. Thank you, Angus. Um, have we got questions? Uh, Councillor Hands. In your submission, Angus, you mentioned both the UAGC and both, both the UAGC and Steels, um, UAGC and loan funding. Just wondering if you could expand on your comments there around use of those tools and what we would be appropriate. That's in my written submission. Yes, um, I've always been a fan of the river rating districts that you run and the way that the money is. Um, sorted through where the beneficiary pays. Um, I'm actually uh, believe that uniform annual general charges are a great way to raise money, especially for people things. And this is where I struggle a wee bit because um, I've got the impression that the people of uh, Canterbury on a whole at the last election voted for a more picturesque Canterbury um, with planted streams, and good habitats. So to me, that's a people's thing. So maybe you should, in my opinion, have a uniform annual general charge for that sort of work, right up to the absolute limit. So you, you spread, if it's the people of Christchurch that want that, yes, they can take their, they can pay for it and take their drive out into the countryside and see it happening. But at the moment, the people who are actually doing these chores are the ones that you are going to rate almost out of existence. 
Thank you. Any other questions around the table? Doesn't seem so, Angus. So thank you for coming in and all the way from Ashbury for that. Uh, we look forward to uh, considering what you've said in our deliberations. Now we've got two more submissions today, Melanie, uh, if you'd like to come to the table. And then once Melanie's finished, Dot, I think you'll hear. Dot Lovell Smith is then, and so we'll be done. So, Melanie, can you go ahead when you're ready? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, Councillors. Um, kia ora tato, il homa, no Melanie Brooks, toko no, ko te kai whakahaere, MHVY. Um, I've been with um, MHV Water since uh, June 2017, and prior to that I had about 17 years in, in finance, both here and abroad, focused more on leadership and business and corporate banking. Um, MHV Water is a farmer-owned cooperative. Um, we own and manage the infrastructure um, which delivers water to our farmers and also manage their environmental compliance. So we've got about, well, we do have 206 farmer shareholders and they um, we we manage for them on their behalf about 58,000 hectares in the Hikio Hines Plains of Mid-Canterbury. Um, in addition to representing our farmer shareholders as a whole, we also own uh, 15 different parcels of land, which is about 256 hectares of land, um, and we're rated on these properties. A lot of them are small corners of properties or land, um, but some of them also have ponds on them. So um, on average, our rates increase across those properties is 109%. Uh, and for one of those properties, it's $10,000 is the increase year on year. Um, so just before I talk specifically about our feedback on the, um, on the long-term plan, I wanted to provide some context of what we do more broadly. Um, so you'll notice I haven't described us as an irrigation scheme, and that's because we've long evolved away from that definition. Um, maybe six or seven years ago when we would deliver water to the gate and say, knock yourselves out, um, but definitely not now. Um, and I think some people discount our knowledge and experience when it comes to the environmental management space because potentially of their own preconceived ideas um, or of what we may or may not do. So we're really passionate about making a difference. Uh, and supporting our farmers on a journey of continuous improvement, um, both with our infrastructure and with our environmental compliance. So in my four years that I've had with MHV, I've seen a meaningful change in the mindset of our farmers. And pleasingly, we're starting to see not only improvements on on-farm practices, but also environmental outcomes. Collaborating a lot with other farmers who aren't in our shareholder base to share knowledge and help improve what's happening across our whole district. We've got comprehensive groundwater monitoring programs and surface water monitoring programs, which we transparently share across the community to help inform better decision making and research opportunities. We're experienced in facilitating and delivering environmental management strategies, which focus on education, engagement and um, collaboration. Um, we've gone through the sub-regional planning process of Plan Change 2, which is um, part of the Land and Water Regional Planning Framework. We had a consent granted prior to that going through, and we've got another one that has just been granted post Plan Change 2 and post the um, NPS FM20. So given our experience, um, and given when you think about the five transformational opportunities that you've identified, um, which, what, most of which are well aligned to our experience, namely around the sort of regeneration of natural environment, facilitating diversification of land use and building community engagement. I think we're in a unique position to provide feedback on our experience of what works and what doesn't work when it comes to affecting change and getting outcomes and improvements on farm. To be really clear, we want to see improved environmental outcomes, especially in water quality, and we have some significant concerns about the long-term plan namely the cost and position and how that is disproportionately skewed to the rural sector and more importantly that there are insignificant details for us to be able to determine if what you've proposed will actually genuinely drive any improvements in environmental outcomes. Um, I have my doubts. Um, I don't believe that the plan sufficiently lays out how that increase is going to be spent and that's with the exception of the Managed Act for Recharge targeted rate, because that was quite a comprehensive document. Um, so just to go into some more specifics around the statutory requirements, the plan purports to include all the statutory requirements, um, and that was to quote, because you know what needs to be done and what's required by legislation and you want to go beyond that. 
But yet when I've spoken to ECAN recently, um, if the gap analysis between Plan Change 2, your sub, one of the sub-regional plans, and the NPS 20 has been undertaken, you've said that hasn't yet been completed. So how can you know the extent of the statutory requirements are required and budget for those if you haven't done that work? And I also don't understand why you would be reworking plans that for all intents and purposes may meet the NPS FM20 frameworks. So I'm from the Hiko Hines Plains, but let's talk about PC2. And our sub-regional plan, that was gazetted in 2018. That was about reducing nutrient leaching from land use activities, improving the management of water abstraction and irrigated area, and using MA to target legacy issues of quality and quantity of groundwater. So in the plan, you're proposing to spend $24 million in consenting and planning to stop further decline in activity and improve environment for further generations. The existing framework ensures a stop to further degradation and is designed to ensure improved water bodies in the short term. It was put in place in 2018, and we've seen an improving trend in groundwater quality since 2019. Around the water and land portfolio, in LOS 9, there's um, around enable resources to implement GMP. And the way that I read this performance measure, you're proposing to hold aggregated consent entities, so that's the like of catchment groups, collectives, or irrigation schemes, to a minimum of GMP. And I think that's absolutely reasonable. In that same graph, in that same table, you're suggesting that farmers outside a scheme or a collective would be held to a lesser standard. You're proposing that they provide them advice, you provide them advice and guidance to implement GMP. I believe this is completely unacceptable. And it flows on to another concern. And um, I notice in the plan, I notice in the plan you've got funds for consent compliance. And given the workload on the consent compliance team, consent compliance team, I think that's a real positive. But I think there's a fundamental issue here because they are, their KPIs are based on monitoring consents and they're driven on their chargeable hours. Given there are farmers that are still in the ECAN Takiwa who do not have consents, are you also looking to increase the funding to ensure that those farmers will get consents so that they can be monitored? Consents had to be in place in our district by 2017, and I think it's really unacceptable that there's inconsistencies here. One of the other questions you ask are what are the challenges we face? Look, we all know there are significant regulatory headwinds facing all regional councils. ECAN has invested significantly in the sub-regional planning framework um, to give effect to NPS FM 17, and we strongly recommend that further work is done to ascertain the ability to push back the 2024 notification requirements where sub-regional plans are already in place and already on a pathway to achieving the new NPS FM 20 targets. Prioritising rework that will not that will ex, that will be expensive and add very little value in terms of improving environmental outcomes is strongly opposed by MHV Water. Um, as such, we don't support either option in terms of the long-term plan. Plan. The council has set a 5.7% average increase over 10 years as the maximum. What you've proposed is not affordable or reasonable. We believe that both the income and expenses need to be reviewed as part of this process. It feels as though the focus has just been on increasing income and not on cost controls. The possible grants available are a positive and can provide good outcomes for the community. And we've also have some concerns um, that perhaps the private sector could also already be meeting areas where ECAN is looking to also provide facilities or services. And um, cost control is critical. Uh, where you've got great programs, I'm really staggered to hear that, for example, Immediate Steps has a dollar spent. Every dollar that goes out the door, there's a dollar cost with it. I think that really needs to be addressed. Um, you've got a large component of education in the budget for schools, for rural and urban. And with respect, our farmers don't need education from ECAN. Um, they need ECAN ensuring that everyone is on the bus but that's where I believe ECAN can be facilitating and encouraging catchment groups because we will get a much better bang for our buck and farmers will far better learn from their peers. 
Uh, we support the targeted regional rate for managed access recharge, um, and we support other regions who are looking to put into place different projects, having the ability to um, utilise the rating structure for that purpose. Uh, as far as the uniform annual general charges go, um, we do have concerns the rural community is disproportionately carrying the burden of the rate increases, and this is exacerbated when it comes to the split of the uh, UAG um, from the general rates. Um, the feedback I've had from our farmers is, is that they're largely prepared to meet the cost of MA, um, but I fear that some may see farmers as a never-ending source of revenue. And when our rural roads rates are proposed to increase by over 100%, you have to ask if that is reasonable. Um, because whilst the total rate contribution is going up by 24.5%, um, it does just demonstrate the disproportionate spread of that across rural and urban. Um, I also have some concerns around borrowing to cover excessive spending on operational activities. Um, I think that's highly concerning and I wouldn't, we wouldn't support that. Um, support borrowing for capital expenditure on fixed ex assets, but um, yeah, I, I have an issue in the other piece. Uh, in summary, um, your operating principles include listening to the people to serve communities, and that's all of your communities. You need to take into account cultural, social, economic and environmental well-being. You also state that change will be both managed and manageable and that you will enable innovation. I find these statements and your guiding principles, especially the ones about ensuring change is well managed, are largely at odds with the long-term plan. Change management um, is a process that ensures understanding about how the change will actually help and it's really important that when you're making changes, people on the ground can connect between this is the change that's being made. I understand how that change will drive improvements. And I think there's a fundamental gap in the long term plan in that regard. When I think about the amount of money that's being spent and I think about how we could spend that money in our catchment to make change, I think about like limited trials. Um, the way we can use spiky winter grazing practices, land use change evolution. And I think you could really make some awesome changes, but I don't think that will be the way that we're proposing to do that on regulatory change when we already have robust process in place. I just, I just can't see how it will work. I'm worried about engagement. We had a four year engagement process as part of plan change two. Four years, 2014 it was notified, 2018 it was gazetted. And we're looking at rolling something out by 2024. I worry that we will lose people along the way. I don't think the spending will make a meaningful difference on improving water quality. I don't think you'll be getting the best return for your ratepayers' dollars, our money. And I think that money could be used to far greater effect outside of the regional council. Thank you. Before we go to questions, we've got Councillor Marshall first, but I acknowledge your leadership in the space, Melanie, it's helping. Um, I know you're very passionate about this and you take it to heart and so thank you for that and thank you for highlighting the things that you think should we should be looking at. Councillor Marshall. Good, Peter, and thank you so much for coming out to present today. Um, my question is on what you've spoken about today that we shouldn't be revisiting plans that are already on their way to achieving bottom lines. So is it the belief of yourself or your organisation that the current plan rules for the Heinz area will achieve the targets set in the new national policy statement. If you can push your button again, please. Yeah, sorry, one one of the time. <laughs> that makes sense. And um, so as far as the, the targets under the NPS FM20, the targets need to be achieved over a generation. And a generation and discussions that I've had with Minister Parker have been defined as between 25 to 40 years. And so when we think about plan change two, plan change two, the objectives that we have in that are to be achieved by 2035. So we've got a that's 15, 14 now, I keep forgetting we're in 2021. Um, that's, a, that's a window, a 14 year window for us to achieve that. So if you think about the journey that we need to achieve to a, uh, the 2.4, which is the national bottom line, in the NPS, it explicitly states that the targets set by the regional council must be ambitious, but reasonable and not impossible. 
has a specific wording in the clause. And so we have a plan, a sub-regional plan, that went through a four-year planning process to achieve targets based on the information we had at the time that were ambitious but reasonable. And, and I don't understand why we would rework that when that takes us on the trajectory towards that 2.4. Thank you. Uh -huh. Thank you. Any other questions? Uh, Councillor Hands, then Councillor Edge. Thank you, Mel, for your comprehensive submission. Uh, just given your finance background and, and our debates around uh, borrowing, just wondering what your view is in terms of borrowing or doing a plan change. Would you consider that to be capex or opex? So it's a challenging one, isn't it? Because whenever we look at resource consents, we put that as a fixed asset. And so when you've got it as a fixed asset, you would think about the life of that asset and then amortise it over the life of that asset. Um, so if you were going to do a plan change and that plan change was over a longer period, you could argue that that could easily be financed. Um, I suppose then that feeds into if you've done a plan change that you did that was gazetted in 2018 and then you're doing it again, does that mean that you're going to then take that and you're going to depreciate the rest of the life of that asset that you have? Because you would have pr presumably done that for the term of that PC2 that you will have put it on your balance sheet. Are you then going to go, well, actually, now that we're redoing this work, all of that needs to be depreciated now because we don't have, there's no value in that anymore and we start again? I don't, I don't know the answer to that. That's, a, that's probably an accounting question. I thank you for that. So we've got um, Councillor Edge. Thank you. I, I was just um, wanting some clarification. Uh, you commented that you didn't consider the education was needed for farmers, uh, but you also suggested that change management um, you needed to connect with people on the ground. Do you think the two, if you could clarify how those two work here? Yeah, so it's it's difficult in the long term plan to get it to get a, a feel for exactly what the split of everything is. There's not a whole lot of detail in there to know. So when it comes to education and for farmers to learn what's right, I believe that comes from peer to peer in terms of what they can do on farm. And um, so if the education that you're talking about is can E can be the one standing up there and saying to their farmers, this is how you're going to do winter grazing and this is how you you should be um, managing the rotation of your crops. I think that's a no. I don't believe that's an ECAN role. Um, similarly, I mean, I, I lead a, an irrigation scheme and I try not to make that my role because the farmers don't really appreciate me getting up there and standing them telling them how to farm. But if you're talking about how to engage farmers or anyone for that matter in a change management process, I'm not necessarily sure I'd qualify that as education. I would maybe call that collaboration or engagement. So perhaps there's a change, like the way we're defining those terms is slightly different. Thank you. And we've had a range of submissions today. And we had a, I just wonder what you um, think of this principle. We had a, a submission from a teacher of economics, and he was actually encouraging us to, to actually follow the polluter pays principle. So I just wonder where that fits in and how you see what he can should be doing. It's a really interesting question, and and I, I think it's one that, that would warrant further discussion. I think the challenge, if you are going down that line, is to be able to define what pollution is. Um, so at the moment, the tools that we we would have, if you were talking about nitrate as a polluter, um, the tools that we have wouldn't give us the ability to do that. Um, and so if you were talking about other pollutants, the question would be how you would do that with the likes of the heavy metal runoffs in town, how, I don't know how you would you would account for it, but um, yeah, possibly it's part for a, a wider discussion. That, thanks, thanks for answering that. It wasn't in your submission, so but thanks for answering it anyway. That was good. <laughs> that is a personal view, and not the view of MHV Water. <laughs> <laughs> Molly, thank you again for coming up here and doing this. It's pretty comprehensive what you've told us, and you've put a lot of thought into it, and you. You actually uh, do lead a lot of farmers, so we should be taking note of what you say, and we will take that into consideration when we do our deliberations. So thank you. Now the next submitter is Dot. Dot, I see you down the back there. So we're looking forward to hearing what you have to say. Just a 
Um, I'm a great contributor to the last submitter who had all that scientific information. Um, I've come really from the background of somebody who was, you know, who's been living in uh, Canterbury most of their life and um, have been frankly, well, I left Christchurch for 10 years or probably 20 years altogether to work in the North Island, came back in 2010 and um, was absolutely horrified to um, visit Lake Ellesmere and Te Waihora and the, see the braided rivers and see how um, much that changed from my childhood 70 years ago when they were um, pristine, beautiful environments that we paddled in, that we swam in, that we caught cockabullies in and and just, you know, the whole change has been so um, distressing, I guess, that I've spent quite a bit of time trying to find out about the ins and outs of, of the water quality. And also, um, in the last 20 years, just the effects of, of what the dairy industry is having on um, climate change, <coughs> not only here, but around the world. And so my submission is a very personal thing, and I've just gone through it sort of section by section. I, um, I was impressed by how much work had been put into it. I found the actual um, booklets quite hard to follow, and um, it took me quite a long time to find the detail because the online submission thing was very cursory and brief. So I'd, I'd like to make that as a criticism of the process. But on the, um, <clears throat> once I found the detail, I enjoyed going through it and finding out things. Um, so, yes, yeah, so most of my submission is just pointing at issues which I think are important, like water quality, the um, <coughs> um, <coughs> and the, and the adverse effects that it's having on climate change, that the farming practices are having on climate change. So. Um, but since, since I put in my submission, I've been thinking more. And one of the things I think has come up is just the sort of the fact that more and more people are talking about the divide between rural and urban. And um, it seems to me that it's getting harder and harder for the two sides to talk about things to each other. And, um, and I, was, I was quite intrigued and also upset by I got a letter um, from from Nicola um, Greg, the National Party MP, and I'm not in her electorate, but I'm quite close to the boundary in the hey hey. She sent me a letter explaining what she's doing as a new national MP and she, you know, I thought, oh she's the woman spokesperson, that's good. She's cultural advisor, that's good, you know, into culture and arts and that's good. And then I got and um, then I got to the bit where she said, I will work with local authorities and community groups on preservation and conservation to ensure that our natural environment and um, uh, to ensure the preservation and conservation of our natural environment and mitigate the impacts of climate change. So I thought, oh, that sounds good too. But then I got to the sentence that says, I will fight for farmers impacted by punitive regulations and restrictions. And the word punitive just really got to me because it seemed to me that she was already dismissing um, things that ECAN might be trying to do to improve water quality and farming practices. And um, so I've been thinking a bit about, you know, how we can try and get, get through that. Um, Get the, get the barriers broken down between rural and urban um, thinking because, you know, a lot of urban people are disturbed, are disturbed by the water quality in the rural areas. And of course, it's affected, it's going to affect our, and already is affecting our drinking water um, if things get worse. So I'm pleased to see that, you know, um, regulation and, and um, standards are coming in. I'm a bit Disappointed that they're still far too high, the nitrate levels, as far as I'm concerned. I think they should, the, the permissible amount of nitrates in water should be much lower. Um, 
it's much higher than in other countries. And um, I think we're going to have to bear the health um, impacts of that in the future. Um, <coughs> my other issues. <laughs> um, yeah, I think I think the education budget is actually really important. And I, I actually see um, that the support of farmers to help them change um, farming practices is um, is part of that budget, unlike the previous figure. Um, I also think that we re uh, we all, and ECAN especially, which it did in its plan, um, needs to present the vision of what Canterbury could look like in the future to everybody, which includes, you know, from preschoolers up to grannies like me. And um, so that people become aware that, that this is actually something that can happen rather than something that it's a pie in the sky and will never happen. Um, I was in Auckland recently and I mentioned something about Canterbury having problems with water and the Aucklander just dismissed it. He said, oh, Canterbury's water's stuffed, you know, and he seemed to just think, well, there's nothing we can do about it, and especially up here, we don't have to worry about it. Whereas to me, you know, it's something that is vitally important and needs to be fixed as soon as possible. Um, I don't know if I've got much more to sort of push. There's a few things I missed out. One is that um, I didn't really look at the seacoast stuff at all, and I'm not quite sure how far your jurisdiction goes out to sea, but um, I would really, really, really like to see much bigger marine um, reserves because, um, you know, dolphins and things are becoming terribly affected. So I think you just have to watch the space stop on that stuff. We're um, about to redo our coastal plan. We go 12 miles out to sea. Uh, so I'm from Maine, uh, High spring, Springs. Um, and, you know, you've done yourself a disservice. You've done really well here. I mean, you've got a very good um, submission. And you've asked us a lot of questions, so thank you and congratulations on that. Have we got questions? Yeah, I really enjoyed reading your submission, Rob. Um, there's a lot in it. Um, I've just got a couple of questions. Um, and my first question is, um, you've you said here that um, we need a provision for public input when processing resource consents that have consequences for public health. Um, environment. Um, so, do you think something like having a review of of the policy that we have around public notification on our consents would be? I mean, how? What? You know, would would that be acceptable to you? What type of thing do you do you think we should do there? Um, I put that in as a reaction, really, to the previous um, situation. You know, when the commissioners were here. And, and it appeared to me, um, that was when I first came back to Canterbury, and I was just horrified by that lack of democracy and, and consultation and sort of publicity about what was going on. And um, so, yeah, I think there should be some sort of public consultation available. Perhaps um, even, even just notifying in newspapers and things that it's going on the extent of the the extent of the consent um, that the consent will cover um, how long it will go on and and what sort of um, standards the water is going to be expected to be at by the um, you know in a certain time etc 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 I really don't think we should be giving new consents to new water use I think Canterbury's water is totally over um, subscribed already. I don't think the aquifers are, aquifers are coping, and I don't think um, I don't think that the rivers should be used to recharge. I mean, there's a natural recharge going on underground between the aquifers and the rivers, and I think to sort of try and change that any more than what's happening now would be would be really detrimental to the rivers and to groundwater. <coughs> Thank you, uh, Councillor Ian McKenzie. D does your answer to Liz's question cover? D does your answer? Does your answer? To, does your answer to Liz's question about 
no more consents apply to urban development as well as rural development? I mean, just being really mean, I'd like to say yes. Um, I'd, I'd really like to see urban, um, urban development more concentrated and um, so that there's so that planning I, I would really like to see you know a city planning department again like they used to have in the old days um so that you don't get this piecemeal um, planning by developer which is gobbling up places like marshlands and um the horse well beautiful horse or land that used to grow spuds and things like that and the orchards have all gone you know from around christchurch so that um, what was the question? <laughs> uh, yeah, I would, I would, I suppose, like to see, yeah, that there's some sort of public eye going on these developments that just pop up suddenly and get rid of a wetland here and a, you know, a market garden over there. Um, there. There's a lot of development that could happen within the city, where you know houses could go up. They could, we could have residences above light industry. We could have residences again above shops and things like that to keep the footprint of Christchurch from spreading out. Thank you. Other question? Well, thank you, Doc. As I said before, I thought you'd done really well with that submission. You started off by saying that um, it's kind of hard to read, but you've come up with some good stuff, so thank you for that. We'll take that under uh, as we do our deliberations. We'll, we'll consider what you've said to us today. So thank you for coming along. Um, that brings us to the end of proceedings today. But before we move, I'll ask uh, uh, Councillor Apanui, are you going to do uh, karakia to finish? Thank you. Okay, Tina. Tina. I mean,